Happy Friday's Eve, everyone. It's 9 a.m. here in New York City. I'm Brad Smith alongside Brian Sazi. This is Yahoo Finance Live, and here is what to watch this morning. A weird bull market gets weirder. Stocks are looking to close out a big year, but a record share of S&P 500 members have underperformed the index in 2023. We take a deeper dive into some of those names. Crypto mining stocks are outshining, outshining Bitcoin. Names like Marathon Digital and Riot Platforms have more than doubled in value in the last two weeks of December, and these are some of the hottest tickets right now on the Yahoo Finance platform. We ask, how high can they still go? Plus, the road ahead for Xiaomi, the Chinese smartphone maker announcing its first electric car, the Xiaomi SU7, in hopes of taking on Tesla in the world's largest EV market. Well, let's go back to where we started this conversation at the top of the show. The Santa Claus rally rages on here. Futures are mixed this morning with the S&P 500 sets to open near all time highs as traders remain optimistic about rate cuts in the new year. But there is still a divide between the U.S. markets haves and the have nots, which is causing what eToro's Cali Cox recently described as the weirdest looking bull market in decades here. And so. Uh, of course, where let's get weird is perhaps the staple in Austin, Texas. Here in the markets, a much different scenario as we kind of shape up going into 2024 here, and particularly as there's been so much light shown on the Magnificent Seven over the course of this year off of the prominence of AI really being a sentiment driver. It's a larger question of what will the Fed do next year also, and well, when the, will that pivot come ultimately in the form of an actual cut? But then additionally, one other area that we've hear, heard continue to be cited is the small cap catch up further perhaps here. Uh, and Liz Ann Saunders of Charles Schwab has repeatedly told us that, of course, you can look at the Russell 2000, but if you're looking for one that has a profitability filter, perhaps the S&P or the S&P 600 is one that she's keeping her eye on. Brad, I'm here to blow a little minds this morning. Sure. Uh, maybe people don't realize this, but there are 493 stocks besides the Magnificent Seven, the S&P 500. <laughs> there are. And guess what, guys? <laughs> they trade every single day, but really an interesting chart from our friend Torsten Slock, a economist over at Apollo, uh, with this interesting chart saying 72% uh, of stocks in the S&P 500 have underperformed the index this year. And what is causing us? I would actually say this is, in fact, very weird to see a market essentially being driven by seven uh, companies, uh, Amazon, uh, Apple, you name it, NVIDIA, of course. This is, Brad, really reflective of the underperformance all year long of healthcare stocks. You have Pfizer, uh, you have Moderna. A lot of these stocks are down close to 50% on the year. The market has not wanted to give uh, or has just not seen people, investors, step in here and nibble at some of the bargains here. And hence, you're seeing uh, this stat from the likes of Torsten Slock. But I want to get over to your very own Jared Blickery standing at the, the big board uh, looking at really Maddie, Maddie Mills. Let's get over to Maddie Mills, who is uh, looking at some more weird things. M Maddie, it's just a weird day, weird market, and I'm just mixing things up. But take it away. I mean, I'm honored to be compared to Jared Bryan, so I appreciate <laughs> it. And uh, actually, I have some insights from him I'm going to share with you when I get to my final name in this bucket of stocks. It was hard for me to pick uh, some names that have underperformed, particularly in the last few weeks, because we have seen some broadening out, a little bit less weirdness that you mentioned of just those seven names leading the broader S&P, only about a dozen or so names clearly in the red over the past week. But I'm going to go through a couple of them, starting it off with Moderna, this name getting pummeled this year. It's actually the second uh, biggest laggard in the S&P year to date, not being able to hold on to those gains during the COVID-19 pandemic. And how could they, right? How could they hold on to the growth that they got following the creation of that vaccine? They're going to be looking to some other potential growth areas heading into 2024. The street has not necessarily uh, rewarded them for their investment in cancer research, cancer drugs, but they are looking to get regulatory approval in the U.S. and Europe for respiratory virus vaccine. That could be a boon for this name moving forward. And that's why we could see some potential upside to this name heading into the new year. But watching that regulatory approval is going to be the thing to look at for investors. I also want to talk about Nike, guys. This name really struggling in earnings over the course of this year. And this latest earnings report was no different for this name. Uh, that forward guidance is the thing that investors were looking for. And they did not hear what they needed to hear, particularly 
particularly when you look at sales, uh, especially in China. And this is the thing that we've been talking about so much. When are we going to see recovery in China? Now, some of my sources, including Jay Hadfield, who we recently had on our program, said that the growth story in China is there because the situation is so dire. There has to be some upside. My question is whether or not that upside is going to be seen in some consumer names like a Nike. And sticking in the consumer space, I want to end with a name I know you love, Brian, uh, starting on Walgreens here, having a really tough performance this year. Uh, today, a year ago, they were actually at their 52-week high. Not so much today, but they have gone up over the past four trading days, uh, hitting above that Bollinger Band, though, twice, which could indicate that there's a little bit of overbuying in this name. And that could be because of some tax loss harvesting in a name that's down so much year to date as investors look for ways to curb some capital gains. That's one potential explanation for some of the upside movement we're seeing here. Uh, also, we'll have to watch what they do with uh, Boots heading into 2024. Will we see an IPO of that name over in London as they look to figure out what to do with that partnership, having not gone through with a sale uh, over the course of this year? So maybe seeing some growth in the Walgreens name, but we're going to have to wait and see, you guys. Maddie, real quick, I just want to clear up. I get my TV makeup from my local CVS. It's just my store. Nothing gets Walgreens. I just, I, they just sell better makeup. I CVS mean, does? I'm I'm an yeah. Elf fan, so whether or not uh, it just depends. Dwayne Reed, CVS, Walgreens. If they have Elf, I'm good. <laughs> Eyes, lips, and face. All of us got those going on for us here this morning. Madison Mills also got some words for us. Appreciate it, Maddie. We'll be checking in later on in the show. Also, with some words for us, bond bulls have been clobbered the last three years, but after a two-month rally, it looks like 2023 will be the year of the comeback as global bonds have gained nearly 10% in November and December combined. That's the best two-month run in the history of the Bloomberg Aggregate Total Return Index. Let's bring in Yahoo Finance, Jared Blickery, to tell us what this means for investors heading in to 2024. Hey, Jared. Hey, Brad. Uh, don't call it a comeback, or maybe we should. Uh, bonds have just been decimated over the last three years. This shows um, the rolling gains that we've seen in the bond market going all the way back to 1990. What stands out, these last two months have simply been off the charts almost, uh, compares to the global financial crisis we saw two months in there. And uh, just an interesting comp overall. This, uh, this bull market that we've had has been like any other that we've probably seen in the last 40 years. Um, it's been accompanied by rising interest rates. We're having to reorient ourselves around that mindset. And the bond market in general has been the tail that's wagging the dog, which is all of the uh, rest of the global risk markets. Here is the U.S. Uh, yield curve right now. As it stands, this purple line is October 19th. This goes, uh, excuse me, October 19th, yes. And uh, actually, this blue line down here, this is December 28th. And you can see what a big drop that we've had. We've gone from 5% in the tenure, uh, tenor right in there, dropped over 100 basis points. We're looking at, what, 3.9% right now. This has been a huge tailwind for equities, and all of this is based on the expectation that the Federal Reserve is going to be cutting rates next year. And those expectations keep building. Um, the consensus call is for a soft landing. I think there might be a no landing scenario. But regardless of how it shakes out, there's one more element in the global puzzle that I need to talk about. And that is the Japanese yen and also the Bank of Japan. These are the global central bank policy rates. And here is the US. We got the Federal Reserve up there north of 5%. We got the ECB a little bit less Less than that. And here's Japan all the way down here by point negative, negative 0.1%, a holdout from the negative uh, bond yielding years that we saw many years ago. Anyway, the game of catch up here is going to be played. If the U.S. does not cut rates, the BOJ is going to have to increase their rates. And uh, given the size of their bond market and their participation in it, that could have a lot of spillover effects. So that's kind of what we're hoping to avoid. So the bottom line is if there's a no landing in the U.S. or even a hard landing, this does not look good. It's only the soft landing, which is now the consensus call that's uh, looking good for investors. Jared, I would pay big money for that analysis you just gave us. I, I just have to say this. I Jared, appreciate it. Yeah, Jared Blickery, good stuff. We'll, we'll catch back with you later. All right, major stock indexes are heading toward another weekly win to round out the year. We've seen stocks reach record highs the last few weeks as investors are more optimistic heading into 2024. But what could derail this rally? Let's bring in Jose Rasco, Chief Investment Officer of Americas at HBS, HSBC Global Private Banking and Wealth. Jose, good to see you here. A lot of folks I'm talking to on the street right now, I guess maybe in typical form, are looking for a, a correction in the first two weeks of January. Do you see that happening? 
Well, I think, and good morning, first of all, uh, and thanks for having me on. And I think, look, uh, happy new year to everyone. Uh, but as we head to the new year, look for the market to begin to uh, incorporate a couple of things. Number one is the election process begins in early January. Secondly, uh, don't forget, we could be heading toward a government shutdown mid-January and early February, uh, and they know they need to get this done, but it is an election year, so expect a lot of volatility around politics and geopolitics. We still have two major wars going on, and uh, you know clearly I think the market has risen dramatically, and we're still bullish on U.S. equities, don't get me wrong, over the long term, over the course of 2024. But in the short term, uh, you know, a, a correction would not be shocking at all, no. A shutdown risk, once again, as we've continued to kick the can down the road multiple times at this point. Yeah. When you think about this probability of an actual shutdown versus those prior, what would you place that at right now? Oh, boy. Uh, I, I think, you know, you have to factor in two things. Number one is the need for airtime. It's an election year. It's mm -hmm. a presidential election year. So there is going to be a lot of bantering back and forth and, and using the media to try to achieve other goals than the, the budget. Now, remember, there is a hard uh, stop in uh, the second quarter, at the end of March, I believe it is, uh, as we hit the second quarter, where it, all spending would get cut by 1%. So they know they need to get this done. So worst case scenario, I think we could see a, a month or two of this, but um, I'm really hopeful that they achieve something. But I think a modest shutdown, the odds are probably higher than, than we're comfortable with. Yeah. Jose, who's better for, for the market? I think these discussions are going to start happening now. Uh, an another four years of, of President Biden or, or another four years of returning, hypothetically, uh, President Trump? Wow. You know, it, it, so I think it, irregardless of who's in the White House, the key is really the split in power, right? So if you get a Democrat or Republican in the White House, it is clearly important that we have Congress on the other side of the fence because when you get that gridlock in Washington, markets tend to do better. That is really the key because markets do not like surprises, uh, and therefore, um, you know, we need that split in power regardless of who wins. Jose, so then, if someone owns ten shares of Nvidia after their monster run, are you saying they should rotate out of some of these magnificent seven names because of this ge geopolitical risk? Well, if you, if you look at what's happened over the last month, right, the, the small cap markets have done very well at fourteen percent in December. Uh, the broader the, the equal weighted S and P is up seven, and the and the S and P uh, market weighted is up four and a half percent in the last month. So clearly, we're seeing an expansion, a broadening out of the rally. So that bull market sentiment, you know, it's in place for the longer term here. And if you look at earnings over the next twelve months, uh, U.S. earnings look really good, especially for the Nasdaq. Right, they're very very comparable to what we're seeing out of EM Asia. So while we like EM Asia. We like the stability of earnings in the U.S. markets. And more importantly, remember, when the Fed cuts, U.S. markets tend to lead global markets. And this is going back to 1980s. U.S. markets outperform all major global indices when the Fed begins to cut. When we look out the next year and, and we really assess some of those geopolitical tensions, concerns that the markets are really going to have to consider, as well as balancing that against a Fed that we're all anticipating or there's plenty of hopium to go around, that there's going to be cuts, multiple cuts that come next year, then if that is already priced in at some point because the markets are going to look and try to price it in the best they can six months in advance, where are there other areas perhaps around the globe, perhaps emerging markets, as, as some investors have even brought up, where in an election year it might be apt to perhaps do some rotation? Well, number one, we like EM Asia, right? In particular, India. I think the Indian economy and Indian markets look very interesting. Parts of Southeast Asia look interesting as well. But don't fall asleep on the U.S. markets. Because remember, the, we, I don't think we have properly priced in the, the speed and, and uh, the pace at which the Fed may cut. Remember, they're still restrictive because they're still doing quantitative tightening. So they have to do something to help alleviate the slowdown in growth that we see coming in the first half of the year. Uh, and that could be uh, lower rates, right? Uh, and in addition, now, one thing that we haven't talked about, we keep talking about the cyclical factors going on in the economy, how they're going to slow um, as we head into 24. There is a secular basis to this as well. We see four major secular themes. Number one is uh, the technology boom, the technology revolution that's really going to begin to affect earnings next year. Number two is innovation in healthcare. Uh, and if you look at expectations for, for earnings next year, healthcare has really popped up. Uh, and I think a lot of that's going to be on cost-cutting innovation 
uh, new drugs, new use of drugs, new delivery mechanisms. You're going to see a lot of innovation in 2024. Uh, number three is reindustrialization of the U.S. economy. If you look at construction spending in manufacturing, it's growing in excess of 73% year over year. This is not an emerging market economy. It's the largest and wealthiest economy in the world. And construction in that sector is booming. And number four is, is onshoring or nearshoring. Um, and that is going to help le reduce costs further. And it's going to help expand the, the manufacturing base. And you're going to see, uh, you're going to see a, a modest uptick in employment because of that. Yeah. Jose, how many... Slowing in labor markets. Sorry, Sorry. we, we got to hustle to our finish here. But how many rate yeah. cuts are you in the camp of? And what is the sector that benefits the most in that instance? Well, I think we're so we're looking officially our view is 75 basis points in next year okay. and 75 basis points in 2025. So uh, that gets us to, you know, a 4% Fed upper bound for, for the Fed. Uh, and what we're looking at is the obvious interest rate sensitive sectors that can stand to benefit, you know, housing, autos, uh, durables, technology, right? Financials tend to do well. The problem with housing is a constriction on supply. Right. So even though inflation is going down and interest rates are going down, that's great for bonds. That's great for credit markets. It's great for the consumer. But the restriction on supply is going to keep the housing market um, a little more turbulent than we'd like. All right. One of our reviewers and uh, viewers, I should say, responding in real time, saying he wants more rate cuts. Uh, we will Don't see we exactly. All? Yeah. I mean, look, for those of us looking for a house, we're hoping for as many as well, we can remember, get. Remember, the Fed surprised <laughs> us with the pace. This is very that's similar true. to 94 and five guys right they surprised us at the the aggressiveness on the way up i would not be shocked to see a lot more than than, than we're forecasting well you know? we were we were transitory for so long so the aggressiveness had to follow uh in some instance or another jose yep. rasco chief investment officer of americas for hsbc global private banking and wealth thanks so much for taking the time and happy holidays to you jose happy holidays happy new year thanks thank Same you well, switching gears here, China's Xiaomi is officially entering the heavy populated EV market after spending over $1.4 billion on production. The electronics company is squaring up against the likes of Tesla and Porsche with its first EV model, the Xiaomi SU7. Yahoo Finance senior reporter Pras Subramanian has the details on this one for us. Pras, what do we know and is it going to perhaps make a dent in uh, the market shares of some of those other behemoths? You know, when I heard Xiaomi's owner say that he said it matches up to a Porsche, I kind of had a little chuckle. But then I saw the SU7, and it has the, uh, it looks like it's a clone of a Taycan or a Panamera. You know, uh, I don't want to count out Xiaomi's billionaire owner here because the car has some impressive stats. Uh, it'll apparently use batteries made by CATL battery cells and packs from BYD, uh, estimated range of 500 miles, but that's very optimistic there. We'll use hyper casting or good, ca or good casting techniques that, te that Tesla uses and a sub three second zero to 60 time. So very impressive stuff here. No launch date or pricing, but you know, like I said, Xiaomi's billionaire owner, Lei Jun says he wants to come to be a top automaker in 15 to 20 years. That's a long game right there. Come on, Praz. Uh, how many of these realistically uh, can they sell? But more importantly, how many could they make? I mean, you just don't go from being a consumer products company or electronics company like them, who has had a disappointing IPO relative to when it came public in 2018, and start spending billions of dollars to make cars. Yeah, I agree. I was trying to find trying to find who they might use as a manufacturing partner, and I, and I couldn't. I know they have a battery partner with BYD and CATL, but you really need a, a manufacturing partner to make a car, right? But like I said, these guys have been making smart phones and devices for a long time. They, they now make, uh, I think, scooters and bikes. So I think they're just trying to ramp up that that manufacturing footprint. But you're exactly right. This is, being a car is no joke. It's, we're talking about 10,000 parts coming together at once. So I, I kind of have a hard time understanding how they're going to ramp up even in 10 years. Well, Pras, when you get one of these to review, please uh, include me in that review. I'd be happy to sit in that front seat, both of us wearing Yahoo Finance vests. Pras Subramanian, senior reporter, good to see you. All right, the Magnificent Seven have pulled the S&P 500 higher by nearly 25% so far this year. But another index is looking to finish the year strong as well. Yahoo Finance's Madison Mills has the details. Maddie, busy morning for you. Busy morning <laughs> for me, but uh, not so busy on the stock market as we kind of trail into the end of the year here. Having said that, we are starting to see a little bit of broadening outside of those seven big names. And I want to look at a chart uh, that fascinates me that talks about some of the evidence of that widening outside of 
these Magnificent Seven names. If we look from December to mid-year, those Magnificent Seven names were up 100%. Since the middle of the summer, guys, we've only seen about seven or 6% rather increase in those seven names, and that's pretty similar to about the 4% uh, gain that we've seen in the broader market. So the question for me is, if we've had these recession fears over the past year that led to a lot of the uh, excitement around these seven names for tech companies that had strong balance sheets, really great earnings. Does that mean that if we continue to see growth in the Magnificent Seven this coming year, that there's a macro problem going on? Does that mean that the Fed got it wrong and that we're starting to push the economy into a recession, particularly given the outperformance that we've seen in the Russell? Uh, I know your last guest mentioned up 14 percent in December, uh, outperforming the broader S&P yesterday. So what does that small cap versus large cap dynamic start to tell us coming into the new year? Well, certainly. And you think about balance sheets for even the Magnificent Seven and how much, sure, in margins they're able to generate from some of the larger services businesses and then thrust that capital back into some of the more kind of lofty, ambitious goals that they have long term that are going to drive more profitability. But that still means money that they're going to spend perhaps more aggressively, even though they do have those cash piles. If you compare that to the small caps, is there kind of a different story that's at play that our investors are expecting or some of the largest strategists out there are expecting as well? Well, it's a great question because this, I feel like, was the story when money was free, that it didn't really matter how much uh, debt these tech companies had to take on because money didn't cost anything, and that's obviously not the case anymore. So cutting rates could be a boon for these big tech names. But having said that, I remember a note from Michael Hartnett a few weeks ago saying that uh, investors should own the balance sheet of these tech companies rather than owning the name itself. And that's because of exactly what you said, Brad. The balance sheets are so strong for these names that investment grade bonds of a Microsoft, of an Apple are potentially a good place to be putting money. Uh, And also smaller tech names. I think about some of the ETFs that uh, have a basket of smaller tech names that have been up this year. There is potentially some signaling of overbuying in those ETFs, but still a a way for for investors to get in on a basket of those smaller tech names. I was guys. just lo- I was just looking at uh, that small cap chart, um, Madison, and really I think this all hinges. That entire move hinges on what the Fed may or may not do. And really, I'm looking at the FOMC meeting calendar uh, right now uh, online, and that is January 30th, uh, 30th, and the decision comes on 31st. If there is no sniff of a rate cut, all these things are getting blown up. The Mag Seven, the 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 small cap Russell 2000 uh, as well. That whole trade completely unwinds. And I wonder if we get a sniff of that in the first two weeks of January, if we get some more Fed speak. Well, it's, it comes back to where the dots move at that next meeting, too. Yep. If, if we get a severe type of update where more of those members are saying, all right, we're looking a little bit more dovish on where our dot is placed. And even though uh, Tom Barkin wouldn't tell us which one of the dots is actually his, we'll follow up on that. <laughs> Perhaps we'll get a little bit more inclination like, of... How look, can you... Uh, what the, I mean, I didn't mean to call him out. Like, look, like, he was on with us. This so. is what the stock market moves on, people. Right. Yeah. Dots. On a, on a piece of paper that looks like we it was from 25 years ago. This is what investors are trading on. These things, these dots, Which these, these not, visuals. It's not a forward indicator, also, Brian, as you know. <laughs> no. This is just one decision on one day. It's just like somebody took a pen and they just drew a dot on a piece of paper. Exactly. That's we what, could all do it. And you know? billions, are be, do billions are being made and lost because of those dots. Yep. Right. Pretty wild. We'll have the Yahoo Finance dot plot with uh, Chief Economist Ivana Fritas, who's out there as well, <laughs> yeah, making yeah. some <laughs> top-notch predictions. Every jobs report. Yeah. That's an inside joke for you guys at home. Anyway, Maddie, thanks so much for taking the time here this morning. All your markets action, everyone, straight ahead. Stay tuned. You're watching Yahoo Finance.
Investors are trying to cash into the crypto rush ahead of a possible spot Bitcoin ETF approval next month by buying into Bitcoin mining stocks. So much so that miners are outperforming crypto exchanges and Bitcoin this year. For more on this, we've got Yahoo Finance's Madison Mills here. Maddie, what do we know about this and, and why this move is taking place right now? Yeah, guys, I remember a few years ago, Dan Ives explaining to me that during a gold rush, you mm. don't want to buy the gold, you want to buy the picks and shovels. And that's exactly what we're seeing in this Bitcoin mining stock outperformance. These gains are just remarkable here. You've got Marathon Digital Holdings up 800%, Riot Platforms up 400% year to date. Both of those obviously outperforming uh, those digital currencies themselves, uh, given some of the gains there. Bitcoin itself having 160% increase uh, in 2023. Now, what's interesting is this is an energy intensive uh, process. It involves a lot of specialized computers. So miners are expanding their operations to boost Bitcoin production. That's, of course, in anticipation of that regulatory approval of the spot Bitcoin ETF, which could lead to a lot more demand for uh, that Bitcoin itself. And as you can see here, a lot of firms on the street awaiting that approval. So that's, uh, you know, these, these firms are anticipating that, and especially Marathon Digital and Riot anticipating that, and they're investing in the technology that would be needed to support that increase in demand so that they're ready when the time comes. And, and and this may not be an end of January thing or end of February in terms of the spot Bitcoin ETF approval. I mean, we're, we're getting ready to head out to the World Economic Forum in Davos, and a lot of folks that we're talking to in the lead up think this could happen within two weeks, Brad. Yeah, and I think the other thing is what could take place in April of 2024, which is the halving. And one of the huge things that I've been tracking is for all of these miners right now, the halving is going to create even more costs for them because you essentially look at the computing power. If you're looking at a reward that gets cut in half for the operation of mining, then you're essentially doubling the costs for mining. And so for a lot of these operators out there, there could be another inkling of a thought out there within the markets of which one of these miners looks most apt to be acquired by a larger player out there, perhaps a major bank, perhaps one of the firms that's applied for uh, a, a spot ETF, Bitcoin ETF as well, because then that would increase the number that they actually have in their own holdings as well here. So I think that's one other thought that might be permeating out there, or at least uh, rumbling out there in the market as of right now, especially going into that, that halving that's set to take place or expected in April of 2024. Marathon, as you were mentioning them, as we were talking about them, they just made an acquisition about 179 million dollars worth of Bitcoin mining operations. So uh, that is one particular thought that kind of struck me this morning uh, that could come forward as well here that's perhaps pushing it, this play. And if there's any positive here besides the obvious, it, at least this is being driven by a potential catalyst. Yeah. Right. This is not the broader stock market uh, taking off, trading at record highs on hopes for rate cuts, and that's dragging in like the likes of cryptocurrencies. There's some real potential here to unlock a lot of value with these names if that ETF is approved. That's a great point. It's one of the only names that we've talked about this morning that's not going to be driven by what Jay Powell does, which could be uh, an important thing for investors to think about in their portfolio mix. Absolutely. All right. We are just seconds away from the opening bell on Wall Street and taking a look at the New York Stock Exchange as well as the New York Stock Exchange. <laughs> There's the NASDAQ. <laughs> as we take it's a look there. At both. Yeah, it's somewhere out there in the ether in Times Square. You've got Build Girls ringing the opening bell at the NASDAQ. Got some funfetti in the air. We love to see it. And we've also got She's the First ringing the opening bell at the New York Stock Exchange. So excellent stuff there as we kick off today's trading activity. I want to take a look at the major averages first and foremost. We've got some gains here at the open. The Dow, the S&P 500, and as the NASDAQ is calibrating, it looks like we're going to open higher across the board for all of the U.S. major averages. I want to take a brief look as well at some of the sector activity here out the gate. You've got to look at the 11 S&P 500 sectors. Yeah, I've got the Wi-Fi Interactive pulled up here on my screen. We'll get to Jerry Blickery in a moment. Don't worry about that, folks. Fret not. But XLK, you're seeing that higher right now to start off the day by about four tenths of a percent. Let's put this in context of this abbreviated holiday weeks move that we've seen. And ultimately, you're still seeing gains over the past three days of about nine tenths of a percent. We'll round that off to pulling up the boost, though. You got a little bit of a laggard movement here on energy that's down by about half a percent. We're roughly split or about as split as you can get for 11 sectors here. It looks like about five gainers, six laggards. We'll continue to track that as we move forward throughout the rest of today's session. Plenty of time. Brad, I'm, I'm just so fascinated by the continued action in the in the Magnificent Seven, and if that is extended into the first week of January, if you're an investor and you're sitting on, what, a 237% gain in NVIDIA, what do you do with that stock in the first week of January? Do you just 
rotate out of that position? Do you buy some lagging healthcare names? Uh, unclear to me, but I think that's one of the most interesting stories that are that are likely to emerge in the in the first uh, two weeks of January. I mean, you just got to wonder when is some profit taking going to emerge? And Nvidia up 240 percent year to date. You look at some of the other Mag Seven stocks, and we overlook within this as well the meteoric rise that Meta Platforms has also seen on this broader AI trade as well, up 200 percent year to date. So some of those Mag Seven stocks certainly uh, the sexier parts of the market over the course of this year. But there are 493 other stocks as we mentioned in the. <laughs> S&P 500. Go figure. Go figure. All right, good stuff on the Bitcoin mining. Madison Mills, really, uh, really appreciate it. All right, let's stay on all things tech here. NVIDIA investors have had one amazing year with the stock up more than 230%. So what are your choices in the options market if you want to ride the NVIDIA wave or hop off this bullish tech trade? We have Yahoo Finance's Jared Blickery and Jessica Inskip, Director of Education Product at Options Play, to tell us more over at the Wi-Fi Interactive. Guys? Thank you, Sazi, and thank you, Jessica, for joining me here today. We are looking at gains of NVIDIA of 240%, kind of been in a range here, but investors might be sitting on some gains, wondering what they can do with their money, and today we're gonna to be talking about how that is done in the options market. And uh, first of all, let's go here. We're gonna talk about a covered call. This is an option strategy when an investor sells a call option while also, under, uh, while also un, excuse me, owning the underlying stock. So, Jessica, you have an NVIDIA stock and you think, okay, maybe it's going to go up a little bit, but I don't think it's going to go up a lot. I want to make some money in the, inter in, the, in the meantime. How do I execute this? Yeah, absolutely. So you're absolutely right. The first requirement is you have to own 100 shares of the underlying security. When we have an option, we're creating an obligation to sell in this place with the covered call. And what we're going to do is we're going to collect an upfront premium. It's a way that can be a reduction of your cost basis. So you're reducing how much you've actually paid for NVIDIA by receiving that upfront premium, but in exchange, you're obligated to sell your shares at the strike price that you choose through that entire obligation So you period. could lose them. That's kind of the downside, potentially. You, you could. There's a give and take with options. Give is I'm getting the premium. Sounds like an option. Yeah, that, that All it right. is. Let's get into the nitty gritty. We have a profit and loss chart of one particular strategy. This would be selling one February 2016, uh, February 16 call, covered call for 570 at the 575 strike. Um, and I should say February February 16th is the expiration date, so we've got 40 some days until then. Break That's down right. the math in here. Yeah, absolutely. So we, first of all, we want to select about 45 days for obligation period. It's very important when utilizing options that we specify the right strike price and expiration date. But what we're going to do, we're going to see, receive about $500 worth of premium for this. You'll notice this is giving us some width, as in room for us to still participate in capital appreciation, because when we own the security, we want it to go up in value. That's the goal. So that's our take. That's what this flat line represents up here. These two are standard deviations, which we want to, mm -hmm. it's a way to layer on technical analysis with the Well, options is all about math. There's a lot it of math is. involved. It doesn't have to be in, uh, intimidating though, but just kind of speak as to in general, how options can improve uh, an investor's return here, just in general terms. Yeah, absolutely. So in this point, it's just adding additional yield while participating in capital appreciation. It's a great way to enhance a longer term portfolio just know that you're creating an obligation to sell your shares, but we allowed for capital appreciation. So in this case of the covered call, premium of $5 per share, about 500 total, that reduces the cost of NVIDIA slowly over time. But if you sell, that's still a healthy gain. All right, let's go to another strategy here. Let's say uh, I don't necessarily own the stock, but I want to get into NVIDIA. I think it's, it might have a little bit of a pullback, and maybe I just want to be sucked into that trade. But uh, on the other hand, if it goes up, I might be able to make some money. Uh, but you just break down the math here on that one. Yeah, absolutely. So a cash secured put, this is the other side of the options chain. I don't own the security. We're selling the option, so I'm utilizing the obligation to buy. So I have to have enough cash set aside to buy 100 shares of NVIDIA. But the pros, very similar. I'm going to receive that premium up front. The give and take, though, you'll notice when we go through the real examples, yes. is when we have that premium, we actually have upside risk. So if you're expect, expecting a really large accelerated move to the upside, you actually would make out better just by owning the security. But the way this is positioned is utilizing a cash secured put with the intent to buy the underlying security. We are actually utilizing options to reduce our risk basis. And the worst case scenario means you buy the stock, which was your intent outright if you were intending to buy the shares. Or maybe the worst case scenario is that the stock takes off and you're just left behind. You don't have any participation. That's right, but you still are on your max profit in this type of trade. 
So you'll notice a different structure, mm -hmm. similar expiration, 45 days till expiration. That options are complex that allows you to have that time decay that we want as option sellers but the strike price that we're choosing is 490 yes very close to the stock price because we don't own it we don't need to account for capital appreciation we need to make sure that we buy the security maximize our premium so we're yes. actually getting $22 a share on that one Gotcha, and there is a and there is a price, the current stock price, right there, four ninety five. We got time for a brief another question here, just in general. What kinds of option strategies are investors looking at for the new year? Anything seasonal that might be in play? Well, I mean, there is certainly a rise of those zero days still expiration options. We could spend an hour on that. We for could, sure. um, but that is a much layer of complexity. I think it's very interesting to utilize that more of a market measure. But um, what is emerging is this type of strategy. What we actually described is called the wheel strategy. So I don't own NVIDIA, I mm -hmm. sell cash secured puts at the money, I'll receive $22. I just reduced my cost basis by $22. Yes. You think about that percentage wise, that's 5% you're making in a 45 day period. And it's modest, you're not necessarily having those astronomical gains because you're not participating in capital appreciation at that point, but it's just a structure of buying and selling the stock, utilizing options, much like a, a limit order. Yeah, so investors looking to participate, maybe if if uh, you, we're not dealing with the dividend stock, NVIDIA not known for its dividends, you can still earn a yield in the options market if you play your cards right. Thank you for joining us, Jessica Inskep Thank of uh, Options Play, and we're sending it back to you guys. All right, thanks so much. Excellent stuff there, Jared and Jessica over at the Wi-Fi Interactive. And another story that we're tracking here this morning, got to get to our trending ticker, the New York Times cracking down on OpenAI and Microsoft in a lawsuit yesterday. But could sentiment surrounding the impact of AI chatbots be shifting? In a new note from Evercore ISI, analysts said that investors have begun to view this as a potential growth opportunity, writing, we believe the most likely outcome is that the Times signs several AI licensing deals over the next few years that are each worth low tens of millions of dollars of revenue per year that largely follows through to AOP here. One of the things that I had found when I went back and did a deeper dive actually into this filing yesterday was what the New York Times was alleging here. They said the defendants, Microsoft OpenAI here, engaged in wide scale copying from many sources but gave the Times content particular emphasis when building their large language models or, or language learning models, their LLMs, revealing a preference that that recognizes the value of those works. And so now, New York Times is essentially just saying on top of that, they want to be able to be, they want to be able to monetize their work because they've spent so much in the journalism, they've spent so much in making sure that they build up what is more reputable as ranked when it comes to the generative AI and LLM models. Well, Brad, I go uh, onto the Yahoo Finance platform and I, and I play around with our new uh, compare feature. And you go to New York Times and it's trading as if these deals, these licensing deals that you mentioned that Evercore was talking about, this is a done deal. This is definitely going to happen. Mm. The stock has gone through the roof. It's trading about 45 times trailing earnings on a on a P multiple basis. Market cap of over eight billion dollars. Now Evercore does bring up this good point and I think underscores why these deals ultimately need to get done and will likely get done. Uh, Evercore noting uh, decreases in search volume presents a risk to New York Times 50 to 100 million average weekly digital audience presenting a direct risk to digital advertising revenue. It really it, it falls I think both parties here, big tech and then ultimately the publishers, they have to work together. And you can see that chart there from Evercore really breaking down how much uh, these companies uh, like the New York Times are in fact reliant on, on search advertising and just search uh, on the internet broadly. Deals have to get done. You know, it will benefit big tech, but also of course benefit the publishers that are working really around the clock to put a lot of this absolutely amazing content into the hands of users. And so it's a question of where else could this kind of raise the tide in revenue for some of the other news publications that are publicly traded right now. You think about one that has leaned fully into generative AI, at least on the publishing side, and, and BuzzFeed. I mean, this is a stock that's trading below, what, 27 cents a share right now, uh, and is unfortunately probably on the pathway to some type of delisting notice. But at this point in time, BuzzFeed, News Corp, is what New York Times putting out there so powerful powerful and precedent setting that it could open up or unlock some type of additional revenue for other publications out there as well. Yeah, I wouldn't be surprised if you start seeing these deals really uh, begin to funnel in the first half of next year. All right, we're also watching shares of Alibaba today after China's e-commerce giant attempted to dismiss a lawsuit filed over the alleged sales of counterfeit squishmallows. Yes, squishmallows. A U.S. judge denied the request claiming Alibaba was aware 
of the sales. Uh, I'm a big Squishmallow fan, Brad. Well, look, I've I, seen you next to a big Costco teddy bear. I, I know you're a big I, Squishmallow I, fan. I, I live what I talk about here at uh, Yahoo Finance on air, but it, you know, it's a good product, but also a very copyrighted product, not unlike what we see in China uh, regarding uh, footwear, of course. Large copyrighted uh, and copy type of product. How many Squishmallows do you own? I actually have one, but let's take that offline. I okay. have one, I have one. I bought my nieces and nephews a bunch of them too as well. They're just, they're just, they just feel nice, Brad. It's a solid gift. It's a solid gift. It should feel good. It's better than slinging beanie babies at your sisters like I used to do, and they used to throw them back as well growing up here. And there was the t one that I had. I actually picked up uh, Warren Buffett and Charlie Munger. They own the maker that makes Squishmallows, and at the Berkshire Hathaway annual meeting, Brad, uh, they actually had a truck, that, that blue truck that we showed, and inside the meeting selling these things. So I got two collector's editions. Uh, they are unopened uh, in my home. Uh, they're about like this size. Like, and, and yeah, there we go. There was the truck that was in the Berkshire Hathaway uh, annual meeting last time. Uh, line was to the door. That is what I had. I got, I got the Warren Buffett one. I was pretty excited. Huge, huge, huge find. Well, yeah, no, no, that's massive. That's pretty cool too. They got the Pikachu one there. And I think this is worth a deeper dive here because we used to think about Beanie Babies as an, an alt investment strategy growing up. Mm -hmm. uh, of course, now you think about some of the licensed Squishmallows that are out there and if limited runs could be one of the alt, alt, alt investments that perhaps some, you know, young alt investor thinks about for their portfolio of plush characters at home. You've got Sonic the Hedgehog, Hello Kitty, Disney has licensed characters as well for Squishmallow. So, hey, in the world of alt investments, we're covering the entire range of your portfolio here on Yahoo Finance. I'm going to just uh, refrain before we get a break, really going off the deep end with this topic because you could, and just note that Alibaba shares have had a horrible, uh, absolutely horrible year, massive underperformance versus the S&P. 500. Really questions about that company's, and again, you can see that just horrible year for Alibaba. Questions on the company's business model. Can they split off certain businesses? Do they want to split off certain businesses? Where is Jack Ma? I mean, these are the things constantly uh, coming up with Alibaba, and there you have the shares. Really a terrible year for that company. All right, we'll have much more market analysis uh, straight ahead. You're watching Yahoo Finance.
Travel took off this year. Passenger volumes returned to pre-pandemic levels amid an appetite for domestic and international travel. Here's what Ed Bastian, Delta Airlines CEO, told Yahoo Finance. The big revenge travel, if that's what you want to refer to it as, sure. is, I would say it's behind us, but the big big pop is, is, is kind of come and gone. And now as you're looking at pricing, as you're looking at trends, you know, we're coming off of a peak last year where people just needed to go. They didn't really care where they what they paid or where they went. They just needed to get out. Uh, we're now back into more of a normalized pricing environment, but we still have a, a, a great outlook on, uh, on our revenue. Our, I expect our fourth quarter to be a record uh, for the company in both in revenues as well as in demand. In our industry, on the lower end of the pricing curve, mm -hmm. there is some stress with, with some of the low cost airlines and low fare airlines, but as a full service carrier, whether it's international, whether it's business, whether it's premium, it, we've got a very healthy mix of, of revenue streams that are all contributing to that record performance. Demand was up, and much of that was driven by young people spending more cash on experience instead of, instead of big screen TVs and squishmallows. Back in November at Yahoo Finance's Invest Conference, Anthony Capuano, Marriott CEO, highlighted the impact of young people on the hotel industry. With some of the younger generations, we'd already seen a pivot away from spending on consumer goods towards experiences. It appears when we look at that same data today, that the pandemic acted as an accelerant to that trend across generations. And so to your question why, I think folks have concluded how much they love travel. And when that was temporarily taken away from them in the early days of the pandemic, it was a reminder of that deep passion to explore the world. And now that borders are opening, uh, they want to make sure they take full advantage of those opportunities. Strong demand is great for the bottom lines and stock prices of travel companies, but it might make the customer experience a bit more turbulent unless there's reinvestment of that cash windfall. Ed Bastian, Delta Airlines CEO, continued to mention how Delta works to make the travel experience a little less painful. The demand has outweighed the capabilities, and it doesn't matter whether it's in the airlines, the hotels, the restaurants. Uh, we're now fully ready, fully trained. We've got 35,000 new people that we've added to the company over the course of the last couple of years, and they're just ready to go. And i just give you a stat as to how ready we are at Delta. Yesterday, we operated 5,000 flights. We only had two cancellations the entire day, and both due to weather, and ran 90% on time. So the team's there, the team's ready to go, and people, when they, they, uh, they get into the airports, are going to see uh, a, a great experience. And the other thing that's also interesting for a lot of people as they can come back to the skies is all the investment we've made in the airports themselves. Impressive demand wasn't limited to the airline industry. Cruise lines also rode a wave of post-pandemic growth. Earlier this year, Mark Elwood, travel expert, said he expects cruise ships to continue to grow monetarily and literally. They are piling as much on there as they can until it flips. They're putting go-kart races. They're putting roller coasters. Imagine a, a slide that goes right out into the ocean. They want you to think of this as an entertainment palace that happens to take you places. So the ship itself is of as much appeal as the place it's going. Just rip one right out into the ocean there. Cruise vacations were certainly attractive to people as they took advantage of better value travel rather than higher end experiences. And it generally has been smooth sailing for the major cruise lines. Here's what Josh Weinstein, who is the Carnival Corp CEO, had to say about the upstream trajectory of cruises. You got to start on the premise that cruising is inherently an unprecedented value compared to land-based alternatives. You know, we quantify it anywhere from 25 to 50 percent. So ideally, we want to outperform in any environment. And in an environment where maybe the macroeconomic trends are getting a little worse, you know, candidly, we've heard about a recession for the last 18 months, and I'm sure it will come. But let's say it is coming. Um, you've got an experience that, that cruising can, can provide and the relative value making your vacation dollar go further plays very well into cruising. Uh, and so maybe there's just a combination of the fact that we offer a great product um, and people are really starting to see the value. We're really trying to push on that messaging so people who have never cruised before can really understand that and come sail with us. And I think that's working. As a matter of fact, if you look at our trajectory of our, of our guests carried, 
um, our loyal guest base is pretty much been consistent in absolute numbers when you look back from the fourth quarter of last year all the way through the third quarter. Um, a huge amount of growth, and it's all been been really uh, pushed forward by first time cruisers and new to brand. So, so the message is getting out. And that growth may continue into the future. Royal Caribbean CEO Jason Liberty says cruises are becoming more scalable and sustainable. So as the new ships are coming out, they're introducing new technologies. So they're getting more and more um, efficient. And they're also being prepared to take on alternative fuels as those fuels become available and scalable and affordable, not just for us, but also for society. So what's next for the travel industry in 2024? If this year showed us anything, it's expanding. We spoke to the CEOs of Alaska Airlines and Hawaiian Airlines about what they expect to see in 2024 after the two companies signed a merger deal this year. We talked about the fact for so long that there was this pent up demand revenge travel that has seemed mm -hmm. to play out just a bit. What are you seeing ahead of the holiday season? And then when you're talking about those future plans for fleet, obviously a lot of that surrounded are driven by demand. How you see that shaping up as you look ahead to the next couple of years? Well, you know, demand is looking quite strong uh, for the peak travel seasons. Uh, so we're feeling pretty good about what we're seeing into Q4. Uh, and uh, and into next year, uh, that's still uh, you know to be determined. Uh, but we're hopeful that we have uh, you know the right capacity deployed for 2024 to match demand. And I think that's the that that's the key uh, the key variable for us is is deploying right capacity to match the right demand, mm -hmm. and then you'll get the financial results that go with it. So we feel like we're in a good place. Uh, I can't speak for Peter. We're we're still competitors before this uh, deal gets consummated. So I'll let him speak for that. Peter, go ahead. What do you see? Um, you know, we're feeling we're feeling good about the demand situation as well. Things have uh, have uh, recovered pretty well, so uh, I think it's going to be a strong peak season. We had a good Thanksgiving. Uh, we had good operations over Thanksgiving, which is uh, helpful. So uh, I'm really proud of all our team is doing to uh, compete in the marketplace. So will the industry continue its growth in 2024 or will it be saying bon voyage to its recent wins? French there for us. Oh, bon voyage. Fellas. Bon voyage. We're getting close there for you. But at the end of the day, I think there's going to be an interesting combination of events that take place in 2024. We've heard it on the retail side that could overflow into the travel side, which is a more value conscious consumer at the same time where you're going to see even more of the corporate travel that potentially returns. Even as we were speaking with Ed Bastian, the CEO over at Delta, he remarked about how corporate travel and that rebound here is still something that they expect to reinitiate or rebound further into 2024. Uh, that's something that could really impact the profitability for some of these companies, specifically on airlines, specifically on accommodations as well here. But cruise lines, no doubt about it, they've had an amazing year. Carnival up 130 plus percent year to date. Royal Caribbean up 160 plus percent year to date. Yeah, it makes sense, Brad. A couple hundred dollars, you can drink all you want uh, essentially for for nothing on the boat. I mean, I get, I get it. It's I mean, if you get boozy, you spend more when you're a, on there. It's a value. It's a value play. As for me, I'm watching uh, in 2024 if the deal activity in the travel industry continues. Now, we just talked. You're just watching the interviews between Alaska and Hawaii and them joining forces. I continue to watch this now hostile battle. Choice Hotels going hostile in an eight billion dollar takeover bid for Wyndham. Now, we have talked to the Choice Hotels CEO Patrick Patius repeatedly about this. He remains, I think, undeterred by really the, some of the uh, aggressive rhetoric coming out of the management team over at Wyndham. I think Choice will stay on the hunt here for Wyndham. It is not going to give up. It wants Wyndham as part of its portfolio. And Brad, I think it's going to get the deal done. It's just going to have to happen at a higher price. Yeah, we'll see exactly what that net price is here, especially as those deal talks continue to move forward here. Ultimately, we will have much more of your, your markets action on the other side of this short break. Stay tuned. You're watching Yahoo Finance. we got a deep dive on Tesla on the other side.
It's been a difficult year for leadership companies as companies grapple with high inflation and shaky economic backdrops. But what can investors expect heading into 2024? Let's start with Ted Pick. He's going to take the helm at Morgan Stanley on January 1st here. This is one that you've been tracking in this transition here. Yeah, some of the stories are starting to pop up on Ted Pick. And of course, that announcement was made a couple of weeks ago. A really cool, uh, really helpful, I should say, uh, piece by the FT looking at what some of the challenges that Pick has to confront uh, looking into next year. Of course, Ted. Uh, Coming up, I would say more through the trading and investments banking side of the business. Now, Morgan Stanley, under outgoing CEO James Gorman, who is staying uh, as executive chairman for one year, uh, he has really positioned Morgan Stanley into wealth management. So I think uh, it's going to be important to see how PIC uh, manages really what is now seen as the growth driver inside of Morgan Stanley in wealth management, just given the acquisitions he's made. But, Brad, also let's keep in mind that PIC takes this position. Uh, Morgan Stanley shares... Uh, are down about 12% uh, since December 8th. Uh, really uh, continue to be under pressure, one of the more underperforming stocks uh, in the big banking space, uh, as our very own David Hallworth, our senior banking reporter here, has been writing about. So this stock is not doing well. Some concerns of uh, Pick can uh, be like Gorman, who has really driven uh, a really a massive turnaround since he took over more than a decade. So it'll be interesting to see if he uh, can get through that and a lot of regulatory issues over at Morgan. Yeah, and to this point, I mean, you've had a lot of the banking executives have to continue to make trips to Washington, D.C., discussing what Basel III endgame could mean for capital requirements here. it would be interesting to see the tone that Ted Pick needs to strike with a lot of those regulators going into next year as well. All right, next up we have Starbucks with its new CEO, Laxman Narasimhan, looking to orchestrate a turnaround uh, plan. And, and Brad, I, I continue to be very focused on how Lax handles uh, the, the, the push to unionize Starbucks stores. Now, Starbucks in typical form, has br I, I really think, has brushed this aside as someone who has covered this company for close to 20 years, first under Howard Schultz. They typically push a lot of these issues to the back burner. They think because they're Starbucks, it's their world, and everybody gets, gets to live in it. It's not working like that. It has not worked like this in terms of the union issue for more than a year. I think Lax has to finally figure this out, has to offer potentially some concessions, because the alternative, as you see on the stock chart, this union issue will continue to weigh on Starbucks shares for the foreseeable future if he does not get out in front of this finally once and for all. Plus, internationally, you've got to think about what the expansion plan looks like and what Luxman is going to continue to push for as of right now. I mean, we just came weeks off of what his international scope and what was perhaps defined as a cold brew type of employee memo that he put out from the desk of the CEO and essentially looking out at some of the exogenous risks that exist. Sure, they do exist, but at the end of the day, it's also the mark of a leader in those times, how you're bringing your customers, your employees, the rest of the management team through that and continuing to grow out the business and the prospects there. And I think China is one area where investors have continued to ask the question of where will they ensure that they maintain the market share they've developed while also improving the brand sentiment within that particular region as well. I'll just say real quickly here, Brad, before we jump to uh, one other one, I just didn't like that, that letter from Lax that you mentioned. You know, it looks to be that he wants to continue using that Starbucks blog like Howard Schultz long did, weighing in on social issues. I think for Lax to, to turn around investor sentiment, just be a good Starbucks. Be a good operator. Drive better results. Be good to your employees and let the results speak for themselves. You don't need to hop onto that Starbucks blog and try to be Howard Schultz light. Yeah, well, yeah, exactly. Uh, Howard Schultz eventually, when he did leave Starbucks, eventually went on to go into politics uh, for a brief stint and very brief. Uh, also here, we got to finally talk about Elon Musk. From X to SpaceX, there's a lot on tap for 2024. I think investors just want to know what is going to take place in 2024 that Elon Musk just places so much of his time around because that's going to have a broader overhang on what the stock actually does, what the margins look like. Is he ready, honestly, to um, continue to cut in order to just to get some of the Tesla models into driveways, into garages, into charging stations as well? Where does the network grow out in terms of the superchargers? Because that is the overhang for the amount of people who are looking to purchase or even finance. So where financing is even perhaps rosy, I would I dare I say rosy because financing a vehicle financing anything right now, not the most rosy environment, but in the event somebody does still enter into a purchase of that vehicle, where do they then look across that network and feel confident? Because that's the hang-up for a lot of people that were looking to buy an EV right now. Demand waning, a lot of the vehicle companies have had to pull back on some of their ambitions that they have as well. Among many things I'm watching, Brad, really is how does Tesla perform potentially in another year where EV prices continue to fall? Uh, the used values of Tesla vehicles continue to, to decline. You also 
of GM and Ford continuing to roll out large number of EVs in this country and do so very aggressively. So lots of concerns here, I think, on Tesla after a pretty good year. Uh, but straight ahead, Yahoo Finance will bring you special coverage on all things Tesla, from Elon Musk's wild yard X to insight into what to do with Tesla stock after an electrified year. We'll have you covered. Stick around. The show goes on. Yahoo Finance Live is what you're watching. I'm Brad Smith alongside Brian Sazi. We're about 37 minutes into today's trading session. But forget that for a second here. 2023 has been a rocky year for Tesla and CEO Elon Musk. Is a billionaire distracted running several companies at the same time, immersing himself in controversy and dealing with regulators? Early on in the year, he had laid out his goals for the EV company. Listen to this. Our goal is to do 20 million electric vehicles a year. Yeah. Fewer vehicles will be needed, at least passenger vehicles, uh, with autonomy. So um, there's some debate as to what that number is, but it's, it's some number less than the number of vehicles needed today. There's roughly 2 billion cars and trucks uh, in operation in the world today. And yeah, so what we show here is actually, I think, only 1.4 million or, or so. So we're, yeah. we're, we're represent 1.4 billion, I mean, or so, so a smaller fleet. And you know the, the numbers are here in this presentation are around 85 million vehicles a year produced. So 20 million vehicles a year is the goal for Tesla. But going into 2024, it seems like there is even more on the horizon for Musk to focus on. For one, the social media platform formerly known as Twitter, a.k.a. now X. That is one thing. You've also got SpaceX and a potential IPO. Don't hold your breath on that one. Elon Musk doesn't like public companies. He's been very vocal about that. But we will see if investors have a different say. And, of course, there's two mystery products where they've got 300 million and 700 million of those marked off for their global electric fleet coming forward. And Brad, I'm still rereading uh, the note that Adam Jonas, longtime Tesla bull, put out from Morgan Stanley uh, on yesterday. Uh, really bringing up a good point. You have the stock, you have Tesla shares really uh, on a hot streak here, despite no new product potentially hitting the market next year. Of course, they're going to make more cyber trucks. Maybe they tease that new product you, might mention, you mentioned. Maybe they continue to improve the interiors in their cars, which to me are just not where they need to be. But no new product from Tesla. Can they make their can they make their numbers in terms of sales and profits in a year where they're not coming out with something 
I don't know. And coming off of a year where they already did so much to slash prices in order just to get into driveways, in order to get into garages, so that consumers were hopefully getting into the Tesla ecosystem, and perhaps they could upsell them later on. Tesla stock up over 100% year to date. You were just taking a look at the chart. Despite Musk's split attention, we've got our very own Jared Blickery, who's with us, and he's been tracking the stock moves here. Jared, what have you been finding out? Brad, well, the stock is up 111%, and it's been a rocky road. In fact, stock is off about 13% from this high that we see right there. Um, and what this uh, purple line is, is just a share price. And then in blue here, in cyan, we have their EPS. So adjusted EPS, as you can see, has been dropping all year long. And uh, it's kind of a rubber meets the road scenario. Let me show you a three-year chart of Tesla. Uh, all stocks, almost all stocks, pretty much uh, bit the dust. Uh, at least had a tough time in 2022. But if we take a look at a five-year chart and you were to look at um, their EPS and the estimates from analysts, they were staggering higher here. And it's only within the last week that they've been coming down. So it might be a case of expectations getting a little bit too high last year, especially during that route that we've seen. But Tesla is in a much better position than it was years ago when it had to worry about its cash position. And compared to its peers this year, let's just run an equal weight here comparison so we can see on the top line, Tesla, in terms of EV makers and their components, up by far the most. That's up 111 percent. Then we have Li Auto and Xpeng, 83 and 45 percent, respectively. We also have Neo. That's another China play. That's down 4 percent. But Tesla's biggest competitors arguably coming out of China in the future. What does that market look like? Well, there is a huge overhang of uh, potential demand in China that just did not materialize this year, not only for Tesla, but for a lot of other uh, companies that do business over there. So that's a huge part of the equation that we don't know. Uh, will the Chinese economy be jump started in the year to come? But you can see here, this is a clear case of have and have nots. We had an incredible uh, barn busting rally this year that really was centered on the mega caps earlier on, but then we had a huge game of catch up over the last two months. But not all of these stocks have participated. You take a look at the bottom row, a lot of these stocks down 75 to 99 percent. That's this year alone. If you take a look at Faraday, a lot of these EV stocks, uh, they peaked in the in the wake of the fiscal stimulus and the stimmies that people were getting in their checking accounts from the labor market in the early pandemic. A lot of these stocks peaks and it's been a sto and it's been a not steady slog. It's been a, a steep slog down ever since. So basically 100% loss there. And I'm not trying to pick on them. There's several other stocks in this uh, category. We got FSR, that's Fisker. Um, that's down 84% over the last five years. You take a look at the last three. Number is a little bit worse. Um, you got Arkimoto fuel cell. A lot of these are, are smaller names that simply were probably just riding the hype wave up in 2020 and 2021. 20, and when the rubber met the road, they didn't have what it takes. So I think in, in terms of Tesla and analyst expectations with respect to their profits, probably just uh, an effect of normalization. But the tailwind that Tesla had as being a member of the Magnificent Seven should also not be overlooked. How, how steeped is Tesla in the AI movement? Tangentially, but not directly. So that's something that I think will shake out in the year to come. Jared, that is great analysis. You know, that chart you showed uh, with Tesla stock price going up and the earnings estimates going down really defies a lot of basic principles in terms of investing. You often hear that stock prices rise, when stock prices rise, it's a large part because estimates are in fact rising, but that chart tells a totally different story. Yeah, it does. Um, and good to point that out. Uh, but as I said, expectations were probably getting out of hand in the years prior. So um, we'll have to see what the equilibrium point is. Good stuff, Jared. Really appreciate it. All right, let's stay on Tesla here. Tesla stock still has a lot going for it heading into 2024. Our very own Madison Mills is here with the three big catalysts for the EV giant, Madison. Guys, I still can't get over that soundbite we played earlier. They can't even get their own numbers right on this stage, not to pick on them again. But come on, you're saying that you're going to have 20 million in annual vehicle deliveries this current year's uh, upcoming target for 2024 is just 2 million. So a lot of aspirational goals, to put it lightly, uh, for Tesla moving forward here. Now, having said that, to give them some positive news, guys, I didn't know this. Three of the five biggest vehicle sales in 2022 were actually trucks. Um, so the Cybertruck cyber move for Tesla heading into 2024 could be the thing that saves them when it comes to some of that margin compression that they've continued to mention on their earnings calls. But the big 
big question is the next gen batteries for those cyber trucks moving forward. Also, the ramp up in production of those cyber trucks. They're expanding their factories in Mexico to uh, allow for some of that production ramp up to con to uh, continue as concerns uh, about that production volume remain on the street. Uh, now, we also have anticipation of that $25,000 vehicle uh, for Tesla coming in here in the next six months to a year. That could be a boon for this name if they're able to kind of expand uh, their market share by allowing for a little bit more of an affordable name. Uh, but an affordable product is not always good news for margins. So I'm curious about how they're squaring that with their margin compression concerns that we've heard Elon continue to talk about. Uh, more long term, though, guys, we've got the Dojo supercomputer and, of course, Optimus the robot. I can't not mention that. But the question <laughs> is, uh, these are long term goals. It feels to me as uh, fantastical as a self driving car at this point. When am I going to see it? When am I going to be able to get in a self driving car that takes me to and from the East Village on a Saturday? Well, I'm night? An actually an, I'm an Optimus robot. So you're getting, a, you? you're getting a demo real time. Now, really? So yes. Is that why you're able to write on paper here that's actually a computer? No comment, Brad, over to you. <laughs> you know, <laughs> as we're thinking about Optimus, the 4680 battery, and then lastly, the Dojo. You, you talk about a reality check that might need to be had over at the company. They were talking earlier about this year, the Dojo being able to compete with the NVIDIA H1 by the end of this year. I now, we know. already have NVIDIA <laughs> iterating on top and already talking about the A100 and the H100. So they're already, again, miles ahead of where the rest of the field in whatever AI play they're trying to make, catching up with NVIDIA at this point in time here, too. Did you see, did you see that robot photo with that, that B-roll we were just showing? I mean, that is just, that is a glimpse of what making, I think, the manufacturing line will look like. There he is, the Optimus is. robot. That is the future of the Tesla manufacturing line, in well, my humble opinion. Who needs to negotiate with the UAW when you've got a bunch of robots <laughs> walking around? <laughs> Maddie, so thanks true. so much for joining us, breaking down some of these key catalysts here. Let's continue the conversation. It's been a roller coaster type of year for Tesla, with pricing changes, distracted CEO, slow EV adoption, yet in the stock, you're seeing some climbing. Our next guest maintains a buy rating on the stock and a $267 price target. Here to give us the bull case for Tesla, George Janarakis, who is the Can Accord Genuity Managing Director here. George, take us into your thesis here and outlook going into 2024. Uh, so happy holidays and, and thanks for having me on. Look, uh, Tesla had a difficult 2023 because, as you guys referred to, they had to cut prices in order to stimulate demand for their vehicles. And the goal was always to counter the impacts of interest rate increases and keep that monthly payment sort of the same. And there was some data out yesterday that talked about EVs finally sort of catching up to ICE vehicles and that price gap being anywhere between five and $8,000 on average. So we're pretty close. And as that gap closes, I mean, we believe that EVs are superior in almost every way to ICE vehicles, so we should really see adoption hit the S-curve. Now, in terms of what the outlook is for 2024, the last conference call Tesla had was one of the most morbid I've ever heard, and I've been covering the stock for a long time. And what that did was it resulted in estimates for next year, for 2024, coming down. So Tesla's always had this aspirational goal of growing its units by 50% a year. The good news is that now consensus is about 20%. So people have already factored in this reduction in an outlook for 2024. So we'll see what they have to say about demand. We're at about a little bit less than 2.3 million units. The street's about a little bit less than 2.2, and we'll see where they end up. But ultimately, what people are looking to is not what happened this year or what might not even happen next year. It's the earnings growth outlook for 2025 and beyond. And you know we're close to $10 in earnings in 2025, probably more than that in 2026 and 2027, hopefully. And what we assume is obviously a lot of unit growth, but also a return to mid 20s gross margin. And over time, we think that margin has significant upside as they upsell full self driving software to all the vehicles that are out there in the marketplace. George, when you talk to investors, is there a subset that say, George, we appreciate your bullish take, we get it, we like what Tesla's working on, but we are not real fans of Elon Musk and how he has just come out here in, on various social issues. And we are concerned about how this company might fare over the next few years because of what Musk does with X, SpaceX, whatever is the case. What do you tell them right now? Well, so he is without a doubt a controversial figure uh, and says some things people don't like and says other things that people do like. But that hasn't changed in over 10 years. 
you know, I recall, you know, when people thought the company was going to go bankrupt in the late 2010s, he gave interviews where, you know, he, you know, he cried to a reporter, you know, he smoked marijuana on the Joe Rogan pod podcast. So this ain't new news. You know, he's who you have to take in to uh, invest in Tesla stock. And, and thankfully, he's done an incredible job. I mean, he's being compared to Steve Jobs, right? And he's probably the tech titan uh, of the last century. So, look, people know who you're dealing with when you invest in Tesla. It's not new news. He's all over the place. Uh, we're fans, but you know that's that's for us to do. Ultimately, what matters with stocks, ultimately, what matters is earnings growth, and we think there's a lot of earnings growth ahead for the company. Even within a visionary leadership team, you still need realism as well at the end of the day, right, George? And so in terms of the targets that Tesla has really had to answer questions for, and quite frankly, in some of the both model side and even delivery of targets that they've set forward for the amount of vehicles that they might produce one day, they've missed on some of those targets. So for the bull perspective here, where do you still have to grapple with the missing of targets that Tesla continues to showcase? Look, they, they've missed uh, some near-term targets throughout the history of the company, without a doubt. They've actually beat some, too. But w when Elon Musk talks, you know, when he's giving his goals to the world, it's not just for me and you and for investors. He's trying to inspire the three, four, five companies that he's the CEO of and he navigates. So he has to set those aspirational goals. And even if they haven't hit them all the time, I mean, look where the companies come from basically nothing you know, 10 to 15 years ago. So he has to be an inspiring figure and set targets that ultimately the company will hit. Look, he said himself, sometimes he's late, but he always gets there. And, and even with full self-driving, there's an incredible amount of skepticism that this company will accomplish what it wants to. We think he will. You know, we think the company will. They've taken a completely different approach relative to other companies in the marketplace. They use cameras only and they're using neural networks only which means that they're relying completely on ai to navigate their vehicles other companies like mobileye or rover that we cover have a take a completely different approach and uh, you, you know one of your previous guests mentioned that tesla is not an ai company i we think they are the ai company because ultimately real world AI is about self-driving. You're literally taking AI to navigate a vehicle from one place to, a, to the other. There's no more productive use of AI out there. Forget you know chatbots and all this gimmicky kind of stuff. This is real world AI. This is what where AI uh, literally hits the roads and makes our, our roads more, more, more productive and more safe for everyone. George Giannarikas, uh, Canaccord Genuity Managing Director. Always good to see you, George. Thanks for giving us time throughout the year. Happy New Year to you. Likewise. Happy holidays and happy New Year. Appreciate it. All right, heading into 2024, Tesla faces several risks. Let's dive into those with longtime Tesla investor Ross Gerber. Gerber, Kawasaki Wealth and Investment Management CEO. Ross, always nice to get some time with you as well here. We were just talking um, with a prior guest on, on the risk to Tesla, their financials, their stock price because of, of some of the sort of just the views he has taken in terms of on social issues. How concerned are you that next year his views start to hurt the demand and, and hurt the stock price of Tesla? Well, first of all, shout out to George. You know, I read his, his Tesla and his work. You know, he's a great analyst and, and a great uh, person to follow uh, if you're looking for Tesla data. And, and I think his point about earnings being the driver of stock prices is ultimately what's going to determine Tesla's success next year. So the fact that Elon has, you know, become, I, and I don't think it's equally uh, a similar controversy of smoking weed on Joe Rogan to making severely anti-Semitic remarks. You know, these are different levels of, or, or telling everybody to f off. You know, so, so I think if Musk's behavior continues to get more and more extreme, that is a risk to Tesla sales. But the bottom line, as George pointed out. It's the best vehicle on the road. It's the best value on the road. You know, so consumers literally have to buy a lesser car because they don't like Elon. And so I don't know if consumers are going to do that or not. I know certain consumers are for sure, but there might be many others that just simply want the best car. Yeah, balancing whether you want to continue to buy from a figure that perhaps 
goes increasingly divisive versus just saying, all right, I'm able to just kind of take the juice and ultimately just keep moving and be comfortable with my car purchase, at least at well, this point in time? Well, it's, you know, Tesla is Tesla and Elon is Elon. And I think the best thing Tesla can do is continue to differentiate its brand, you know, as Tesla. And Haven't that's they why intertwined I'm so much of that so brand much. with Elon, though? Well, it's hard. You know, it's really hard because Elon is basically the face of the brand and the voice of the brand. And they've been, you know, if you notice on Twitter, um, Tesla has been tweeting more as Tesla. Um, they've been defending themselves more. We've seen more attempts at advertising. And I think if Tesla goes full in on advertising and continues, you know, to sort of build its brand, Elon's effect will be less and less damaging to Tesla overall. But the bottom line is you can't diminish the effect of the damage that he's caused. Ross, let's talk some numbers here because we, we were showing in a, in a prior segment how the earnings estimates for next year for Tesla have continued to fall really throughout the year, but most notably, at least according to Yahoo Finance data, over the past 90 days. Can this stock continue to work higher next year if earnings estimates continue to come down and Tesla does have some product miscues? Well, I don't know about product miscues. I mean, they're going to struggle to put Cybertrucks out next year, but that's expected. In my mind, it's a launch year and it's an incredible new technology and product. Um, that said, I like that they've lowered expectations this much because it gives Tesla opportunity to beat. So if they can actually increase margins by lowering costs and or um, not have to lower prices um, because demand picks up, maybe we get lower interest rates and maybe Tesla beats earnings over the course of the year. And I think that's what a lot of the analysts who have price targets at 300 or 350 are thinking that Tesla would might earn closer to $5 than let's say the less than $4 that's expected. And if that's the case, a $300 price target does look reasonable for Tesla. But right now, you know, $4 is, you know, where I'm at. And, you know, so Tesla's a fully valued stock, but, you know, we're long-term investors. So, you know, we're very bullish on Tesla's long-term. And it is an AI company. I, it's absurd to, to not you know, give it credit for where it is. An AI company at the multiple of NVIDIA, at the multiple of, what, what's the comparison? Well, NVIDIA is a hardware company, so they're in a particularly good spot right now because everybody needs what NVIDIA makes, and there is no, you know, AI without NVIDIA at this moment, um, where Tesla has the first application that's pure AI that actually helps society. So large language models are wonderful, and, and they're just at the, you know, beginning stages of its potential, but but Tesla full self-driving has been going on for years and it's pretty close to driving. So, you know, we've got a real world AI driving car. I don't know what else you want. I mean, it, it sees in real time what's happening on the road and makes adjustments and drives for you. So it's not perfect yet, but it's improved dramatically over the last year. And once again, I think it will get solved. It's just how much time we're at a point where the technology has gotten so far that the incremental increases in ability are harder and harder. But yet, you know, nobody wants any accidents in a Tesla, you know, full self-driving. So that expectation is extremely hard to meet. All right. Uh, Ross, next time we're just going to scrap the conversation. We're just going to have a jam session. I see all yeah. those Les Gibsons in the back. Great stuff here. Ross Gerber, Gerber Kawasaki, Wealth and Investment Management CEO. Thanks so much, Ross. Yeah, thanks for having me. Have a great New Year's. Happy New Year to you, too. Thank you. All your markets action straight ahead. Stay tuned. You're watching Yahoo Finance.
We've been talking all about Elon Musk's companies this morning, digging into their performances this year and what may happen next year. But the man behind those big names is also important to understand. He's done a lot in 2023, maintaining Tesla's status in the EV market and continuing his rebranding of the company formerly known as Twitter. As a leader, is, as a leader, is Musk effective or is he taking on too much? Bill George, former Medtronic chairman and CEO and author of True North and Authentic Leadership, joins us now. Bill, thanks for giving us some time here. We've really been trying to make the connection on, on some of the uh, outlandish stands that, that Musk is taking in terms of social issues, potentially starting to weigh on Tesla's stock and its performance. Do you see that day happening? And, and if so, is that 2024? Yeah, I think Elon's got to decide, is he going to be the greatest inventor of our era, which I think he is, or is he going to be a social commentator? So I'd give him an A plus as an inventor and an F as a social commentator. Uh, and so, he, look, what he's done with Tesla, what he's done with, with uh, space, SpaceX and Starlink and with potential for some of his neural networks, uh, I think is absolutely incredible. And I hope he'll continue focusing on that. But all this time on social commentary is really distracting and it doesn't make him look good. I think, honestly speaking, I think on the social side, he's developed kind of a messianic complex that he can kind of move the whole world. And I'd rather have him get back to inventing great things and move the world. Okay, and so for customers who see this profile and say, yes, great inventor, but at the end of the day, do I want to purchase from the inventor who's turned more of a commentator to your particular point, who's made the acquisitions, who's changed perhaps the entire construct of a social platform that maybe you went to and now has become less safe? Where do you kind of toss the ball up in the air and, and ultimately kind of see where it lands there? Well, I, I know people, a number of people that are not buying Teslas because of a social commentary, but uh, I think the sales are still going to be strong and people that want the automobile, they'll buy them. And frankly, investors that uh, are going to look at the product and how it does, unless it is social commentaries. But I do think it's having an overall negative impact on his image. And frankly, it's hurting people. Uh, and he needs to get back to a civil network. If he could take X or what he used formerly Twitter, and make it more like uh, LinkedIn, where we had more civil discourse, would be a lot better off. This, this anti-Semitism and racism and homophobia and everything on X is really driving really bad discussions and hurt, hurting uh, the country and the world. So I'd rather see him get back to a more civil discourse approach. And why not? And uh, Bill, do you think uh, Tesla's board has just lost complete control over Elon Musk, and they're just inclined to let him do whatever he wants. Well, no one controls Elon Musk <laughs> any more than they do the former president. He's going to do what he wants to do. And uh, but I think what he should have really is a set of a holding company, Elon Musk holding companies, and then appoint a CEO for each of these companies. And I think that's what's needed. He hasn't done that. And they'd be far better off if he would do that. And each could have a separate board and he would own the whole thing. And I think that would be very advisable. And some could be public like uh, Tesla and some could be private uh, like SpaceX. And he could make that call and uh, make a tremendous amount of money for himself and for investors, frankly. And I think he's done a great job of that. Do you think kind of set the, uh, frankly, he's got to find a way out of X. Do you think that he attempts to do that? Do you think he attempts to consolidate everything under X at some point where he's already talked about having a super app that potentially connects to uh, all of his other holding companies as well, whether that be Neuralink, whether that be Twitter or X now, or uh, even some of the other kind of features that he's put forward in, in Tesla and how that could all link together? Well, he's been talking about this for a long time. We haven't seen anything. And Tesla is, or excuse me, X has continued to degrade uh, its commentary. And he was talking about trying to compete with PayPal and other payment sites and a lot of other things. Uh, I don't think that's likely. I don't think the world's calling for that. Uh, I think it does need a news site. And I think uh, if they get back to what the old Twitter was, they could be that site, uh, but they've gotten away from it. But no, I don't think he, I think he treats his inventor companies over here and a social commentary company over here. And I think he's looking for a way to, to deal with that. And it certainly isn't going well, attacking your advertisers and saying they're trying to blackmail you. Look, advertisers are going to do what they're going to do, what's going to help their brand. 
And any more than Tesla's advertising is there to help its brand. It's not going to be on sites that harm the brand. So I think Elon has got to separate these two things and, and get rid of trying to be uh, the world, the guy who's trying to change the whole world with his social commentary. Change the world. You were talking about earlier, and earlier saying about AI. Yeah, be the one that puts AI into place. Self-driving cars could be fantastic. Uh, and I know there will be a few accidents early on, but I think uh, I really encourage them to, to go forward on that score. Bill, George, always great perspective uh, that you're able to provide and weigh in here on some of the broader leadership movements that we've seen here. Uh, thanks so much for taking the time here on the day. Happy holidays and uh, happy new year to you as well. Former Same to you and Chairman thank you and for having me. It's great to be on Yahoo. It's great to see you. All right. We've got all your markets action ahead, everyone. Stay tuned. You're watching Yahoo Finance. Twenty twenty three was a year of highs and lows for the housing market. Affordability continues to be a concern for home buyers, but two of the sector's biggest foes are finally retreating mortgage rates and inflation. There may be some surprising resilience for housing in the year ahead here and a lot to break down, particularly a few things. Number one is where the rates move next year, and that's going to determine the effects of the supply and demand side of the market. And on the supply side, particularly, it's the number of existing homes that are not listed because rates are not in a favorable position for the people that are in those homes to then enter into a new 30 year or whatever the term is more mortgage that they might be looking at as well. Yeah, really tricky time to just study housing more broadly, Brad. If you have, these, you have a pool of 75 million millennials that may come back into the housing market during the spring buying season, that of course is something to watch. But also, I'm also watching if home builders can continue to jack up prices. Toll Brothers reported in early December, and a nugget that I think got lost in their overall earnings release is that they jacked up prices $16,000 in their most recent quarter and didn't see a real complete fall off in demand. They actually saw contract value pretty strong. So can Toll Brothers continue to do that over the next uh, really year? And then will others follow suit? And then 
are those 75 million millennials, are they able to finally own a home and buy a home if all these home builders are, are lifting prices? Well, and remember Toll Brothers on that luxury end of the market, right? So if they're servicing a customer that has more ability to purchase, even in this environment, there's less of a thought or less of a risk that they would step off of that purchase decision even right now, as challenging as it may be when you look at other consumer groups or potential home buying groups there as well. But then you also have to think about what they're doing right now and just building homes and expecting demand to fill or backfill uh, in this process that they call specking within the home or new homes market as well. You know what has, it hasn't been a good year for home improvement retailers. You know, I was looking back at some of the results that Lowe's and Home Depot have reported throughout the year. Those sales and those profits have really decelerated. People are not out there buying washing machines, not out there buying dryers. It has really slowed down as people just don't have any more home left to remodel because of all the remodeling they did during the pandemic. Yeah, the vacuum cleaner is the biggest expense item that I'm putting into my home right Love now. Love me a new Dyson. All right, home builder stocks rode a wave of momentum this year despite a housing shortage and higher interest rates. Investors want to know, can home builders still beat the odds next year? Yahoo yeah, Finance's Jared Blickery is at the Wi-Fi Interactive with the break breakdown, Jared. That's right. Uh, market dominance by the home builders. You thought those 8% mortgages would get in the way. That is not the case. Just check out this home builders year to date heat map that we have here. Some of the lesser gains are to the left and the bigger ones. We got uh, DHI that's still up to 70, 71%, Lennar 65%. I'll get to them in a second, but check out Beezer Homes. That's up 168%. And just check out what's happened over the last five years, just really exploding this year. So it's been really interesting to see home builders at record highs with industrials and tech stocks at record highs. Uh, it really is the case that over the last two months, a lot of things have been swept up in this rally. Here's uh, Havnani and Enterprises, another story, record high right here. Uh, but let's focus on Lennar right now. Lennar up 65%. They had a solid quarter in Q4. This was despite ongoing pressure from interest rates and affordability. Uh, they expect Q1 guidance to show new order and delivery growth compared to last year and last quarter. And this is another stock that is ending at a record high here in this year, up 280% over the last five years. Uh, we can also take a look at Dr. Horton, as I call them, a very similar chart there. They recently said they expect home delivery uh, to grow in the home, excuse me, they recently said they expect home delivery to grow in 2024 despite housing market conditions. Um, and then you could take a look at Toll Brothers as well. Uh, here we have Toll up 108%, 214% over the last five years. Uh, uh, CEO Doug uh, yearly noted uh, plans to expand communities by about 10% in 2024 and aim to be ready with inventory when a drop in rates coincides with the spring selling season. So let's take a look at those rates that we've been talking about. As I said, they reached 8% um, and we are off of those highs considerably, down 6.67%. And by the way, that's for a 30-year, 15-year, a bit lower at 5.95%. But it was, a, it was a pretty steady rise in to the middle of October here, but you take a look at new home sales, barely dented. So the time frame is a little different here. This goes back about five years, uh, but ending the year, let's say this is about 20, the beginning of the year, we are ending down only slightly. This is 590,000. At the beginning of the year, we are looking at about 620,000, something in that range. So it really hasn't suffered as much as a lot of analysts uh, thought they would. And for that matter, it was kind of logical to think that there might be a bit of a dip here, but it just goes to the secular strength of the argument that we still don't have enough homes for the people who need them. And it's going to take years for the supply and balance to uh, reassert its to equal to find an equilibrium. Jared, I just want you to know I will be calling uh, that company Dr. Horton uh, for the next <laughs> 75 years until I it retire. It was done to me two years ago. Never look back. All right, Dr. Uh, Blickery, thank you so much. All right, we're starting to see signs of a shift towards a buyer's market. Mortgage rates slightly easing and more people listing their homes for sale. Redfin predicts 2024 will be the year home buyers can finally catch a break. From on All Things Housing, we're joined by Chen Zhao, Redfin Head of Economic Research. Uh, good to see you here this morning. So with rates, with our, that first rate cut potentially coming in the first half of uh, 2024, Chen, how do you think that the spring and summer buying season will shape up? Hi, absolutely. Yes. So we think that um, 2024 home buying season is going to be 
um, you know, better than what we saw in 2023, was, which was largely a frozen housing market for existing homes. Inventory was really low, um, mortgage rates were, was really high, and home prices remained really high. So that kept a lot of buyers on the sidelines. Um, what we're starting to see is, as you guys have mentioned, mortgage rates are starting to come down a little bit. We anticipate that continuing into 2024. And very importantly, we're starting to see a lot more homeowners come to Redfin agents to talk about potentially listing their homes and we're seeing that rate um, you know substantially higher than it was in 2023 so we think that the inventory of for existing homes could um, be quite a bit higher in 2024 than in 2023 which should be welcome news for home buyers and coupled with um, slightly lower mortgage rates we think that'll help to unfreeze the housing market a little bit so we should see transactions starting to increase in 2024 um, we see us ending the year at a pace of about four and a half million um, existing home sales, um, which would bring the total for 2024 to about 4.3 million home sales. Hmm. And then um, if you think about them prices, well, that really just depends on the relative increase in supply versus demand. Um, we see a potentially larger increase in supply than in demand, which means that home prices could, could actually fall a little bit nationally in 2024, what, maybe 1%. What type, okay, so 1% there. I was gonna ask what type of material difference or delta are you expecting in pricing specifically with more listings that come on the market? Yeah, so 1% may not sound like a lot, um, but when you you know, think about what happened during the pandemic when home prices were going up, you know, like 10, 15, 20% year over year for a couple of years there, um, you know, a 1% fall is actually a pretty big, you know, difference. Um, and even as mortgage rates were, you know, increasing in 2023, we didn't actually see home prices falling nationally on a sustained basis. Um, but we think that we've really hit a ceiling for affordability now. We've reached this point where, you know, rates are really high. They're going to fall a little bit, but they're not going to fall like a ton. Um, and prices have remained pretty high. So we're at this point where prices can't really increase very much. So as more supply comes on, we do see prices easing a little bit. So this isn't going to, you know, um, completely change the picture. It's not a complete game changer for home buyers who are wait waiting for prices to fall, but it should help to ease the picture a little bit. Jim, what's your best advice to that millennial who has been on the sidelines the past few years wanting to buy a home but just hasn't been able to afford it? Do they buy at the first sign of rates coming down in the first half of next year or do they actually wait for the Fed to cut rates and potentially buy that house uh, later in 2024, early 2025? So my advice to anyone who's looking to buy, especially a first time home buyer, is to not try to time the market down to like the month. If you're right now sitting there trying to, you know, find a home, especially when inventory is so low, when you find the home that is appropriate for your family and if you can afford it, you can, you can make those monthly payments comfortably, I would, you know, go for it. Um, if you're worried that rates are going to fall more, well, you know, you can refinance when rates do fall more, but it's very hard to time the exact dynamics of the housing market. You know, what's going to happen between January and May and December is really hard to predict. We can sort of foresee kind of these broad trends, but I'm not going to put a ton of money on, you know, May being slightly better than March or, you know, worse than September. So I think you should just think about your own personal circumstances more than trying to figure out the exact, you know, month of the year to buy. Chen Zhao, Redfin Head of Economic Research. Chen, thanks so much for taking the time here today to break down this housing market with us. Appreciate it. Thanks so much. Absolutely. Let's continue the conversation. New home sales took a steep drop in November, falling over 12% from October. As affordability continues to challenge consumers, but as mortgage rates continue to fall, is recovery on the horizon for the housing market? For much more and that question, our next guest predicting just that, calling for a supply-demand dynamic shift. Meredith Whitney, who is the Meredith Whitney LLC founder, joins us now. Meredith, thanks so much for taking the time here this morning. Let, let's begin there. What is really going to be the catalyst for the shift? Is it is it rates alone, and does that do the job? You've got two major demographic shifts going on with the com uh, within the country, and I think your prior guest was great, super cool and super smart. Um, I, I would uh, break this down regionally because I think that's very important. So first of all, the U.S. economy is remapping itself regionally, and it has been since the great financial crisis. So you see more growth in areas like Texas and Florida, 
um, Utah, Colorado, um, South Carolina, and you see population migration um, going along the lines of economic opportunity and economic growth. So there's more job creation in those states and less job creation in states like um, New York, New Jersey, Pennsylvania, Ohio, Illinois. So you've got that trend going. Um, and so you see more housing demand in states like Texas, all those states that I mentioned, and less housing demand in areas where there's less economic op- opportunity. And then the, the other major demographic uh, trend you see is the aging of America. So what's called the silver tsunami is um, 10,000 people a day turning 65. And by 20. 20- 30, um, the entire baby boomer uh, population or uh, generation will be over 65. So that'll be 21% of the um, uh, the U.S. population. So there'll be more people over 65 than under 18. Um, And that creates a, uh, uh, that will create a different environment and will will be, you know, several, lasting several years. So um, the AARP, uh, estimates that 51% of people over 50 downsize their home. And uh, people over 50 are 74% of total U.S. Home, homeowners. So if you just take um, you know half of that, you've got about 30 million homes that should be coming on the market. And the peak in existing home sales was 2005 when you had around 7 million um, uh, transactions. So you've got a big... Um, a big sort of pig through the python what, that will start, I think, um, later part of uh, 24 and go on for the next several years. So um, th- that, I think, is what's going to be reshaping housing in America. And I think that's what will put pr- a regional pressure um, in terms of uh, more and less on home prices. Meredith, that, that silver tsunami that you're talking about, can you dive deeper into some of the you know, what environment does that create? So you have all these homes potentially coming to market. Does that severely weigh on prices or do prices eventually start to take off because people are, let's say the millennials are in there buying these homes potentially a little bit cheaper than they thought? Well, again, there's going to be more of a uh, price weighting on areas where millennials or new home buyers are not going to be, right? That's where you're going to see the supply demand um, differential, right? You've got a demand supply imbalance now. There'll be a supply uh, demand imbalance, um, I think, over the course of the next several years, probably five plus years, um, beginning, as I said, uh, in the latter part of 2024. So I think that, um, uh, you know, I, I think you're going to see, like I said, regional pressures. And for the millennial or you know, you've got the lowest household formation rate you've had in 160 years. Um, millennials aren't getting married. They're not buying homes. They're choosing not to buy homes. Um, you have more like a, a demographic of young men who um, are, are don't have, have very little interest in even dating. So that's Pew Research. Um, so 30, 50 plus percent of young men uh, have no interest in dating. Um, and so that all these trends are weighing, are ultimately going to weigh on the housing market. These are just undeniable trends um, that's going to impact things. And, uh, you know, again, um, uh, the, it'll be regionally more powerful in some areas than other areas. And I think your prior uh, guests estimate of a 1% decline, you could see 20% declines in some areas, and you could see housing in um, areas like Texas and Florida continue to go up. One of the main issues um, we see uh, in the coverage that we provide here, uh, Meredith, is that uh, housing affordability is likely to be a key issue during the presidential election season next year. So this silver tsunami you're talking about, does that crowd out lower income households and then, if so, where do they go? Are they do they just become a nation of renters? Um, I think that you know there'll be a large portion of um, of people that are renters. What's thirty you know thirty five percent of people rent in the United States today? Um, but I think that um, what will happen is um, prices have to come down because if you have more people selling um, than buying, that invariably puts pressure on homes and. Um, increases home affordability. And I think you're going to see that in areas. um, So look, you've got the greatest uh, uh, housing permits um, and construction going on in Texas, uh, less so 
Florida. You don't have uh, major house home construction in places like California and New York and New Jersey and uh, Connecticut and Pennsylvania and Illinois. So you're going to see um, more affordable housing being created by new home builders, um, and you're going to see existing home prices come down. Where do you envision that banks are going to have to create within their own systems and their own models even more leniency when they're evaluating potential home buyers, considering that for home buyers now, especially millennial home buyers, the costs are, are, are vastly different that they're trying to move through, whether that be just coming off the cost of education, whether that be trying to get out of one city into another. You know, where is there going to have to be some type of malleability in what's historically been a model that they could just lean on and, and say, yeah, we'll guarantee that we're going to back you for this house? Well, 70% of mortgages are outside of the banks now. So that's since the uh, great uh, uh, financial crisis. So you're really dealing with like a rocket mortgage or um, other independent non-bank mortgage companies uh, for that. But um, they're not going to have the, the the leeway to do that. That It's really going to come or could come from government programs. Um, and you have a lot of government programs whereby um, you can put very little down for, uh, uh, for a down payment. It's just the servicing that becomes expensive. But if you lower the overall, um, uh, lower, uh, the overall home price, the serviceability becomes more affordable. That's what I think is invariably going to happen because you're going to have more seniors, the silver tsunami selling, and there are fewer buyers. So the give is going to be lower home prices. And you know, to just to uh, uh, tack on to a um, your question from your prior guest, advice to millennials. Um, that's advice is to wait. Advice to um, to boomers is sell, right? The sooner you sell, the higher price you capture. The longer you wait, the lower price you, uh, you buy at. So mm -hmm. I think it's a cat and mouse game. You mentioned the government programs. Does that place the housing market on the ballot when you think about the general election next year? Um... It all, de it all depends, right? So, so you, um, the issue is, I think that the, um, the current administration has been somewhat misguided in terms of uh, the student debt relief is not going to encourage people to vote for the current administration. That sort of, that sort of gas has already been spent. Um, and uh, in terms of then catering to millennials um, or catering to the, it's certainly the bottom half. I, I divide it into um, it's not just the, the big group, the millennials. I call them the avocado toasters, which is the lower half of um, the millennials, 38 and under, and then the Gen Z. So you've got to capture th those are the guys that you want to bring into the housing market. The the older millennials are already in the housing market. Um, so the, the 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 big gap in home ownership is those for 38 and under. Um, and it, it's unclear that creating programs to incite the uh, uh, incent these uh, the, that group that cohort to buying homes is going to guarantee votes. That doesn't mean they won't try, um, but it's unclear now. Um, the issue then more affordability if you want the seniors vote to uh, to to refuel um, the housing market that might work but uh, you know it, it's uh, it's unclear look the the seniors have so much equity in their homes so um, you know 20 million 20 20 trillion in equity was created since the global um, uh, financial crisis. So if home prices come down, um, you're still, people are still making enormous sums on the largest asset in their, in their wallet. Meredith, always a pleasure to get some of your insights, your perspective. Uh, really great having this conversation with you. Happy holidays. Thank you. And, happy New Year. And happy New Year to you as well. <laughs> Thanks so much, Meredith. Let's take a quick check of the markets here as we round out today's show, taking a look at the major averages, the Dow, the S&P 500, and the NASDAQ. Green, the hot trick, the trifecta, whatever you want to call it, the triple-double, just call it up across the board. Green, plenty of insights. Oh, I can listen to Meredith Whitney all day. Wow, great interview. Really enjoy talking to her. Solid. All right, well, that's going to do it for us here this morning, everyone. We'll catch you back tomorrow at 9 a.m. Eastern time, but we've got much more Yahoo Finance starting at 11 a.m.
Welcome to Yahoo Finance Live. It's 11 a.m. on the East Coast, 8 a.m. on the West. I'm Rochelle Akufa alongside Diane King Hall. Here's a look at what we're watching this morning. Global deal making took a turn in 2023, falling below $3 trillion for the first time since 2013. So, what does this mean for the year ahead? Meantime, retirement readiness will break down the biggest changes that will be coming to your retirement plan next year. Plus, a positive outlook. Investors are becoming increasingly optimistic around a Bitcoin spot ETF next year. So how does this set up the crypto industry in 2024? We'll discuss this hour. Uh, but first, we want to take a look at how equities are trading. The bullish sentiment just continues on Wall Street, although at a more mild level as we start to gear up for the wrap up of the year, you're looking at the Dow better by 55 points, the S&P 500 on the plus side by seven. So they're matching that uh, percentage point increase there up a little more than a tenth of a percent S&P broadest barometer of the U.S. market inching towards trying for a new all-time high, the Nasdaq, which has certainly been the standout this year when you think about the tech-heavy sector, uh, better by 27 points. All three of the indexes, the major indexes, uh, trading in lockstep. We want to do a quick check of treasuries. Let's take a look at the 10-year. Uh, the 10-year has been up about two basis points, five-year up a basis point. Uh, so you're seeing some marginal movement uh, when you think about what's happening in the the bond market. But again, the equity market looking to just continue that bullish sentiment, that Santa Claus rally that we've been seeing into the year end. Indeed. Now, speaking of moves, 2023 was not a good year for deals. The global deal making market fell to below three trillion dollars for the first time in a decade. Here are the details as Yahoo Finance's Madison Mills. Madison, not good news if you're a company trying to grow and trying to get some financing. Yeah, not good news for the folks in suits behind some of those deals, Rochelle. I got a scary statistic to point out here because the last time the value of deals fell by 10% for two consecutive years, that was 2008 and 2009. So anytime I'm comparing anything uh, to the 2008 years, I get a little bit freaked out here. Uh, but I want to zero in on three specific reasons that could be potential explanations for why we're seeing such a slowdown in this deal making. Uh, Obviously, following the pandemic, there was such a surge in deal making. I'm sure all of our anchors here every day, we're talking about different SPACs and IPOs. Obviously, there's going to be a pullback following that. Now, during some of those IPOs, particularly over the past year here, I think about Arm, Instacart, Birkenstock, uh, those IPOs, they weren't that successful. So that could lead to a little bit of cold water on some deals that were already in the works behind the scenes. And then, of course, like everything else, that rapid rise in interest interest rates. That could be the sticking point that's not only led to declines in deal making this year, but could also lead to more declines heading into 2024. Uh, and I recently spoke with Mark Cooper, the CEO of Solomon Partners, about deal making. And he actually said, I just want the Fed to stay where they are, because every time that uh, some of his clients turn on the news and hear folks like us talking about the decline in uh, Fed, the Fed rate, uh, rather, hearing upcoming commentary about Fed cuts, that that leads to buyers thinking through, oh, well, maybe I can get a better deal on this if I just wait it out. If I wait for the Fed to cut, could prices go down? Uh, so that commentary could lead to a little bit of softening in the deal making environment. If we continue to hear about in that dot plot coming up in January, if we keep hearing about Fed cuts, that could be uh, more bad news for the investment bankers who are working on some of this M&A. All right. Well, I know uh, many bankers are hoping for the deal pipeline to just loosen in the year ahead. And there's kind of some expectation for that, especially when you think about the IPO landscape. Madison Mills, Maddie, great reporting as usual. Thank you. All right. Well, the Magnificent Seven have pulled the S&P 500 higher by nearly 25% so far this year, while the rest of the index lags. Our next guest sees the stock market rally continuing into 2024, as long as the other 493 catch up. We want to bring in Brooke May, Evans May Wealth Managing Partner. Brooke, so thanks so much for joining us this morning. Let's talk about this catch up trade. What's the expectation? when you think about the rest of the S&P 500 for 2024? Mm -hmm. Yeah, we uh, are very optimistic going into 2024. We think that the S&P could hit 52 to 5,400, and um, that, that would be about 11% earnings growth from here. Right now, the S&P looks expensive at about 21 times earnings. 
But if you factor out those seven names, the multiple is much more reasonable, about 17, 18 times. So we think that there's some opportunity there. And we've seen, as we've seen the breadth of the market improve, meaning more names participating, we think that that's going to give the market another leg up. So, Brooke, in terms of the sectors and the companies that you think have a lot of upside to go, obviously, the Magnificent Seven have been taking all the headlines, but that has left a lot of the S&P 500 out of the conversation. Where do you see the upside? Yeah, right now we still like the the big tech names. We think that there's good earnings growth there. So we don't feel like you need to completely rotate out of those positions. However, there are some really good deals out there and values. Um, one of the names we like, for example, is Charles Schwab. Unlike a lot of other companies that are hitting new highs, Schwab's down 17% year to date. They just completed the merger with TD Ameritrade. So there's gonna be some cost synergies there. In addition to that, uh, the fact that we've had an inverted yield curve has really hurt their earnings because interest is a big part of what contributes to their profitability. So as we see um, the yield curve return to a traditional slope, that'll be a little bit of a tailwind for Schwab as well. And then, Brooke, I want to ask you in terms of just the broader breakout that you're looking for, especially for that target that you're thinking about, S&P 5200, uh, what's the catalyst to get there for the other 493 names? Well, we're going to need to see earnings growth. Um, and right now, again, we're going to, we think we'll see 11% earnings growth from this year to next year. And that's going to be really led by the consumer. As we've seen, the labor market remains very resilient, very strong. And if consumers have job security, they're going to spend. And if they've depleted their savings, they're going to use credit. And we're known we're near an overextension in credit. So if unemployment stays low, um, we think that consumers are going to spend and that's really going to contribute to earnings. And Brooke, we are seeing more cash coming off the sidelines for 2023. Cash and things like mutual funds were definitely king. At what point, though, do you think we'll start seeing more of that cash coming back into the market? And, and where do you think it will head as you look at some of the risks that some of the markets not, might not be pricing in? Mm -hmm. It's remarkable. There's $6 trillion in cash and money market on the sidelines. Last year alone, $1.4 trillion went into money market funds. And surprisingly, you know, we saw the, the 10-year Treasury hit 5% back in October. Money didn't flow into bonds like you would have expected it to. People are comfortable sitting in a money market at 5% and didn't necessarily want to lock in corporate bond rates or treasuries for the next you know, five, 10 years in the 5% range. So um, only 276 billion went into bonds last year. So when there's a little bit of a FOMO catch up trade going on right now, which is why we've seen the market rally these last two months. And we think that's gonna continue. People have missed out on this rally and they're gonna wanna participate. They're gonna take their money out of money markets. And if they haven't already moved into bonds, they're probably gonna add that money to equities. Uh, Brooke, I want to talk to you about um, where obviously we're talking about big names, talking about the S&P 500, but let's talk about small caps. Uh, what's the play there? Where do you see that small caps or Russell 2000 uh, participating in the bullish environment that we're seeing in 20 into 2024? Yeah. Wow. <laughs> Russell, the Russell 2000. The Russell 2000 has rallied since October. Mm -hmm. It's been incredible, and um, there's a little bit of a, a little bit of a, a, a trade there just because those names were suppressed and small caps are very cheap. So really, all all small caps have participated, or most of them anyway. But from here going forward, we think you have to be selective. You can't necessarily buy small cap as a as a broad index. If you look at debt, for example, um, small cap companies, only 40% of them are profitable. So a lot of those companies are working off of debt. And for the S&P 500 companies, only about 6% of the debt is at variable rates. For Russell 2000 companies, around 30% of their debt is at variable rates. So there's a still more risk there. So we like small cap. We think that this is a great entry point because they're still relatively cheap compared to historical averages. But you need to be selective and buy companies that have proven to be able to navigate this higher interest rate environment. Investors going to have to do their homework there. Appreciate you joining us this morning. Brooke May, Evans May, Wealth Managing Partner. Thank you for joining us. Thank you.
Well, JD.com shares are climbing higher today. This comes after news that the Chinese e-commerce company is planning a salary bump for its workforce next year. That's according to a Bloomberg report. Once China's number two online retailer by value, JD came down from the pedestal, making way for newcomers like Byte Dance's Douyin and Pinduoduo. Now, it's been a tough year for the e-commerce industry in China because of high competition and low consumption. And with that in mind, this pairs nicely with the action that we saw from the People's Bank of China, China's central bank, out with a statement today with policy moves to try and battle deflation, stimulate more consumer prices as well, and boosting monetary policy, something that we know has, the Chinese government has been trying to do ever since coming out of COVID and really not seeing the sort of gains they saw in consumption. We're actually seeing almost all the Chinese tickers on the Golden Dragon Index in the green today, Diane. Yeah, uh, but when you think about JD.com, it is certainly getting a bump for the the day, but uh, we'll see how much this kind of carries it forward because it's had a tough year. When you compare it to, as you mentioned, Pinduoduo, Duel, that's the parent company of Timo, and Timo has really taken off this past year. So if you look at year to date for JD, look, it's still down about 50% year to date. So it has a lot of catch up to do when mm -hmm. it comes to Pinduoduo. Duel. I mean, Timo has really taken over. In fact, Timo has taken over uh, Pinduoduo, Duel, the company behind Timo, has taken over so much that it's it's a concern now for Sheehan, and there's been kind of this back and forth to them, and JD.com has uh, become not really a footnote, but it's trying to reclaim some of the position that it had. Uh, so we'll see what this move, I mean, it shows some confidence, I suppose, in terms of its um, in terms of its balance sheet, its ability to actually uh, plan for this salary increase. But can it catch up to Penduel Duel, the company behind Timo? It remains to be seen. It's true. We'll see. I guess they're trying to get out ahead of it. If there is going to be more money poured into this, trying to at right. least make themselves to be the place to be to be the employer. All right. We've got more of your markets action ahead. Stay tuned. You are watching Yahoo Finance.
Wages have grown this year, and that growth continues into the new year as higher minimum wages go into effect in 22 states. And starting next week, you can boost your contributions to several retirement accounts to build wealth and save on taxes. To tell us what's changing and how we can make it work for us, David Wright, founder and president of Wright Financial Group, and Christine Benz, Morningstar Director of Personal Finance, are joining us this morning. A welcome to you both. Um, David, I want to start with you. Obviously, if you're an investor, you know, perhaps you've seen some gains this year. What should you be aware of heading into 2024 and the changes? Well, there's increased limits. Uh, our income tax brackets are increasing the income limits, which is going to create a lot of opportunities for uh, Roth conversions. We're uh, letting our clients know that since brackets are increasing the income limits, there's more Roths that can be converted next year. Obviously, there's going to be higher contribution limits to 401ks, 403bs, IRAs, et cetera. So we want to take advantage of all of those changes as soon as possible in the new year. Also, with the appreciation in the income limits, uh, there's going to be more room for capital gains, appreciated sales on capital gains for the new year. So all of those things are going to tie together for Americans to be able to capture and put away more wealth for themselves in the future. So, Christine, I want to bring you into this, um, in particular with regard to the increased thresholds. It sounds great. I like the sound of it personally. Uh, what are the challenges, though, that people should think about when they think about these thresholds at changing for uh, whether we're talking about 401ks, 403bs, et cetera? Well, one of the key things I always think about is just the virtue of putting things on autopilot, if you possibly can. And that's something that we have automatically if we invest in the context of a company retirement plan where the money's just coming out of our paycheck. We don't have to lift a finger. And it turns out that that's a great way to invest. It instills discipline. It keeps you investing even when the market's volatile. So I would say do that with your other investment accounts as well. Do that with your IRA contributions rather than rushing in a contribution right before the tax filing deadline. Put, put those contributions on autopilot, contribute every month. It just makes it a much lighter lift. So David, with that in mind, obviously a, a lot of changes coming, coming at people. How should they prioritize which are the best ones that apply to them versus some of the ones that perhaps don't apply to them if they're a business owner? How do they navigate all this? Well, certainly the people that are still working are middle class Americans and uh, upper middle class. Obviously the 401k changes and I absolutely agree with your uh, our other panelists here. Payroll deduction is is king here, being able to ratchet that up for the new year. But being mindful also that where you are in your life as far as contributing to your 401k, IRA or 403b is as important as ratcheting up how much you're putting away. Making sure that if you're within 10 years of retirement, understanding what the purpose of the building up of this cash is for, purpose over performance right now, if you're younger than age 50, perhaps focusing more on performance over purpose, that is growth more than income. And Christine, I want to ask you about um, Roth IRAs in particular. Mm -hmm. That's often a subject that comes up when we think about retirement, but there's an income level. So how, what can people do when they think about 2024 and say they're above that income level where they can you know, participate in a Roth IRA? Is the backdoor Roth IRA still an option in 2024? And how can people go about uh, accessing that? It absolutely is. And, you know, it sounds kind of covert and something you shouldn't do, this backdoor Roth IRA. But the basic idea is that if your income is over the thresholds that enable you to make a direct Roth IRA contribution, you can still make a what's called a non-deductible traditional IRA contribution and then convert that contribution shortly after you make it and convert it to a Roth, and then you have a, a Roth IRA. So it's sort of an indirect way for high earners to get money into, Roth, into a Roth IRA account. There are some rules that govern the tax treatment of those conversions. So check with someone who is tax savvy, a financial advisor or a tax advisor, just to make sure that it's a good idea for you. But basically, it does open the door for savers of all income levels to get money into that Roth IRA column, which is a tax-free withdrawal in retirement, uh, doesn't require uh, distributions over age 73. So there's a lot of flexibility that comes along with having those Roth IRA assets in retirement. 
And Christine, I, I want to follow up because as we talk about Roth IRAs, of course, the 529 college savings plan for people who perhaps aren't close to retirement, but they're pouring this money in there. Some key changes into what happens to that money if your child doesn't end up going to college or doesn't qualify for some of these traditional um, educational benefits there. What should we be aware of there and how can people capitalize on it? Yeah, this is a neat provision of some legislation that was called Secure 2.0. And the basic idea is that if you have overfunded a 529 college savings plan, which is kind of rarefied air, most people do not overfund these plans. But if, if in fact, you do and you have more in that account than, than your child actually needs for college, the, the beneficiary, the, the child, can contribute to the uh, Roth IRA, can take the 529 funds subject to those annual contribution limits and get the money into a Roth IRA. So it's kind of a neat technique for people who are in this rarefied era of having over, oversaved for college. Most people are, are scrambling and taking out loans, of course. And David, I want to give the last word to you uh, just to balance things out, especially when we think about RMDs. One of the concerns this past year with regard to required minimum distributions was the impact of inflation. Is there any way that retirees can kind of account for that or adjust for that? Uh, let's say they have to take their RMDs next year or by the end of this year, literally one more day. <clears throat> Well, in uh, passed in 2024 Tax Act, qualified charitable donations are going to be allowable up to 105,000. We were stuck at that hundred thousand dollar level at age seven and a half. A lot of people don't understand that they think RMDs are due at 73, but you can actually start doing qualified charitable donations at age 70 and a half of up to a hundred thousand dollars. So it's a it's a year by year calculation. If you decide you, you can afford to do QCDs, then you can certainly do that. If you believe in this tax or next tax year, you're not going to have the wiggle room for as many charitable donations. You can kind of go year by year with that. But it's important to balance what the purpose of your money is based upon where you are in life and where you are in your retirement. All right, where you are in life and where you are in your retirement. Balance, definitely the key across the board. Uh, thank you both for joining us. David Wright, president owner of Wright Financial Group, and Christine Benz, Morningstar Director of Personal Finance Retirement Planning. And Happy New Year to both of you. Happy New Year. Happy New Year. You got it. All right, we've got more of your market action ahead. Stay tuned. You're watching Yahoo Finance.
Shares for Bitcoin mining companies are reversing course this morning. This comes after double-digit gains miners saw coming off hopes of a spot Bitcoin ETF and a positive outlook for cryptocurrencies in 2024. Let's bring in Yahoo Finance's David Hollerith to give us more details. Hey, David. Hey, Rochelle. Yeah, I, Bitcoin has been down, uh, uh, or it's slightly up, but it's been uh, more or less flat over the past week. And uh, the important thing to know about um, Bitcoin miners is that um, they have to borrow a lot of money uh, to make upfront uh, purchases for mining equipment. And um, two notable uh, publicly traded uh, mining firms, uh, Riot and Marathon Digital, have both announced acquisitions, Riot, for um, purchasing more um, mining equipment and Marathon to acquire two new Bitcoin mining uh, sites. Um, so they are heavily levered as a result of needing all this debt. Um, so they're their stocks can be expected to trade uh, fairly volatile. But, you know, I would say outside of the uh, on the day movements in general, um, the amount of uh, investment that these firms are taking, given that they're so heavily levered, is sort of one more data point we can take around this uh, optimism for what uh, Bitcoin might look like next year. Um, obviously, there's the possibility of the Bitcoin spot ETFs to be to be uh, potentially launched as soon as January. Um, if the SEC grants approval. Um, but, you know, we also have uh, some a more optimistic macro environment with the possibility of uh, Fed interest rate uh, uh, changes next year. And then also the Bitcoin halving, which is sort of a specific Bitcoin type supply change that happens every four years. So in general, I think this is kind of an, uh, a sign, uh, despite the on the day moves um, about, you know, there's a lot more uh, leverage that uh, industry firms are putting into um, an optimistic next year for Bitcoin. And David, speaking of signs and kind of reading the tea leaves, so Kathy Wood, ARK Invest, fo Invest founder and CEO, she also sold uh, the remaining 2.25 million shares in Grayscale Bitcoin and bought over 4 million shares of ProShares Bitcoin. Help us understand what's going on there and kind of what this means for the landscape within Bitcoin. Yeah, so uh, Wood was on uh, Bloomberg TV this morning, and she also spoke to us earlier in the week. And on Bloomberg, she said uh, that the GP GBTC shares um, were sold, uh, one, out of an abundance of caution, uh, given the un uncertainty about whether uh, Grayscale would be able to uh, convert their investment trust into an ETF, uh, given the tea leaves of potential approval for these products in January. Uh, she also indicated that GBTC has also had a very good run this year. Um, earlier this week when she spoke to us, she admitted that um, in anticipation for the ETF movement, um, investors have seen nice profits. Um, and, and because of Grayscale, the Grayscale Bitcoin Trust's historical discount, um, because it's not a full ETF, um, it's actually seen a um, much higher return than Bitcoin this year. Um, so they're in a fairly good place to take some profits. ARK is also in the running to gain SEC approval to issue uh, one of these spot Bitcoin ETFs. Um, and speaking with our anchor, uh, Julie Hyman, uh, this week, she would actually admit uh, that of the dozen or so potential issuers of these uh, products, if they are all to be cleared, um, there's still sort of a uh, only a chance of, of uh, one to three or so is what she said um, winners to take market share. Uh, the ETF game is 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 all about liquidity, um, and I, I think I would just add to that too. Um, we don't have any clarification on this, uh, but given that Ark is is uh, potentially launching an ETF, uh, spot Bitcoin ETF in the near future. Uh, it would it would make sense that um, Art could potentially be taking some of those funds it sold from Grayscale um, and uh, maybe temporarily parking them in Bitto. We don't know this for sure, and eventually uh, putting that money into their own ETF to add sort of a liquidity boost or advantage um, when these ETFs or if these ETFs uh, are launched um, to help them sort of uh, gain market share.
All right, David Hollerith, always having us covered from Bitcoin to banks. Thank you. Meantime, Gas Buddy is out with its U.S. fuel price forecast for 2024. It's predicting a better year to come for motorists. The tech company sees a yearly U.S. average of $3.38 for prices. That's down from the uh, yearly average for this year, which came in at just over three and a half bucks. The company also uh, forecasts that the average household would spend just over $2,400 on gas in the coming year, which is also a drop from the 2023 average of just under $2,500. Now, Gas Buddy has been surprisingly accurate with its past predictions, but the company is predicting that new challenges for 2024 could make for some high levels of uncertainty in fuel prices in terms of market volatility. And a couple of factors that you also have to think about, Rochelle, when you think about kind of the wild cards for this prediction. One, geopolitical unrest. Rest. Uh, could things escalate in the Middle East? That's something that we don't know. That's, you know, a potential wild card. Of course, if there is an economic slowdown, I mean, it's been really all systems go. The Fed looks positioned well for 2024, but that's a potential wild card. Uh, and then another potential wild card is just, you know, wild weather events. We know those happen all the time, and that can certainly impact refineries and refinery capacity. So it remains to be seen what those wild cards could do in terms of this forecast. But as we mentioned, they've been pretty accurate in the past for Gas Buddy. It's true. I mean, and you mentioned the extreme weather, which obviously has the ability to take some of these uh, some of these uh, companies offline, at least temporarily. And but when you look at what it's going to be doing for, for prices next year, some of these predictions, unfortunately, San Francisco, a tough break for you. You're looking at one of the highest daily average gas prices of the select cities that they picked. You're looking at between 570 and 625. So Sorry for you all, but yes. in New York, between 385 and 435, and here in DC, between 390 and 430. So San Francisco really, really bring the brunt of this. We saw a lot of the yeah. California cities going, going to have those higher prices compared mm -hmm. to the national average. But you know, hey, maybe we'll see yeah. more incentives for more EVs entering this. Place. Yeah, indeed. I mean, that's one of the things that could certainly have an impact on fuel prices is if EV adoption continues to increase. It hasn't accelerated at the pace that uh, folks who cover this space expected or even the government in terms of the incentives that there are. And part of that is that issue of range. So, uh, you know, certainly this uh, for motorists on the West Coast is not a great thing in terms of the prices that they're going to see. But it's kind of typical when you think about how prices, how high prices are and the kind of the typical cost of fuel um, on the West Coast and why you see you tend to see more EVs, especially in California. You know, the incentive is greater there uh, in terms of just the infrastructure uh, to support the uh, switch to EV. So, you know, the other uh, thing that to watch out for in terms of impact to fuel is what does the election mean for fuel prices, right? Um, will it bode uh, well for motorists to have, you know, more relief when it comes to what they're spending in terms of their household budget for fuel prices in 2024. But the prediction is nice to know uh, in terms of the expectation for the priciest holiday that's expected to be or the priciest point in the year will be Memorial Day. But that's kind of, you know, we know that that's the beginning of the summer driver se driving season. So that's kind of typical in terms of uh, where prices are expected to be. And the national average then is, is predicted to be between 356 to just over four bucks a gallon uh, come Memorial Day. But there's some time to build up to that. Indeed. I tell you, if it ever hits six dollars a gallon in D.C., I'm, I'm, oh, I'm getting an EV because yeah. I can't live like That's that. That's <laughs> ridiculous. Right. I'm like, wow, how do these Californians do it who have, you know, kind of the traditional car? I mean, yeah, I would definitely switch to an EV. Indeed. Well, we still have all your markets action ahead. Stay tuned. You're watching Yahoo Finance.
travel took off this year. Passenger volumes returned to pre-pandemic levels amid an increased appetite for domestic and international travel. Here's what Ed Bastian, Delta Airlines CEO, told Yahoo Finance. The big revenge travel, if that's what you want to refer to it as, sure. is, I would say it's behind us, but the big big pop is, is, is kind of come and gone. And now as you're looking at pricing, as you're looking at trends, you know, we're coming off of a peak last year where people just needed to go. And they didn't really care where they what they paid or where they went. They just needed to get out. Uh, we're now back into more of a normalized pricing environment, but we still have a, a, a great outlook on, uh, on our revenue. Our, I expect our fourth quarter to be a record uh, for the company in both in revenues as well as in demand. In our industry, on the lower end of the pricing curve, mm -hmm. there is some stress with, with some of the low cost airlines and low fare airlines, but as a full service carrier, whether it's international, whether it's business, whether it's premium, it, we've got a very healthy mix of, of revenue streams that are all contributing to that record performance. Demand was up and much of that was driven by young people spending more cash on experiences instead of big screen TVs. Back in November at Yahoo Finance's Invest Conference, Anthony Capuano, Marriott's CEO, highlighted the impact of young people on the hotel industry. With some of the younger generations, we'd already seen a pivot away from spending on consumer goods towards experiences. It appears when we look at that same data today, that the pandemic acted as an accelerant to that trend across generations. And so to your question why, I think folks have concluded how much they love travel. And when that was temporarily taken away from them in the early days of the pandemic, it was a reminder of that deep passion to explore the world. And now that borders are opening, uh, they want to make sure they take full advantage of those opportunities. Well, strong demand is great for the bottom lines and stock prices of travel companies, but it might make the customer experience a bit more turbulent unless there's reinvestment of that cash windfall. Ed Bastian, Delta Airlines CEO, continued to mention how Delta worked to make the travel experience a little less painful. The demand has outweighed the capabilities, and it doesn't matter whether it's in the airlines, the hotels, the restaurants. Uh, we're now fully ready, fully trained. We've got 35,000 new people that we've added to the company over the course of the last couple of years, and they're just ready to go. And I just give you a stat as to how ready we are at Delta. Yesterday, we operated 5,000 flights. We only had two cancellations the entire day, and both due to weather, and ran 90% on time. So the team's there, the team's ready to go, and People, when they, they, uh, they get into the airports, are going to see uh, a, a great experience. And the other thing that's also interesting for a lot of people as they can come back to the skies is all the investment we've made in the airports themselves. Well, impressive demand wasn't limited to the airline industry. Cruise lines also rode a wave of post-pandemic growth. Earlier this year, travel expert Mark Elwood said he expects cruise ships to continue to grow monetarily and literally. They are piling as much on there as they can until it flips. They're putting go-kart races. They're putting roller coasters. Imagine a, a slide that goes right out into the ocean. They want you to think of this as an entertainment palace that happens to take you places. So the ship itself is of as much appeal as the place it's going. Well, cruise vacations were certainly attractive to people as they took advantage of better value travel rather than higher end experiences, although some cruises can be high end. It's generally been smooth sailing for the major cruise lines. Here's what Josh Weinstein, Carnival Corps CEO, had to say about the upstream trajectory of cruises. You got to start on the premise that cruising is inherently an unprecedented value compared to land based alternatives. You know, we quantified anywhere from 25 to 50 percent. So ideally, we want to outperform in any environment. And in an environment where maybe the macroeconomic trends are getting a little worse, you know, candidly, we've heard about a recession for the last 18 months, and I'm sure it will come. But let's say it is coming. Um, you've got an experience that, that cruising can, can provide and the relative value making your vacation dollar go further plays very well into cruising. Uh, and so maybe there's just a combination of the fact that we offer a great product um, and people are really starting to see the value. We're really trying to push on that messaging so people who have never cruised before can really understand that and come sail with us. And I think that's working. As a matter of fact, if you look at our trajectory of our, of our guests carried, 
um, our loyal guest base is pretty much been consistent in absolute numbers when you look back from the fourth quarter of last year all the way through the third quarter. Um, a huge amount of growth, and it's all been been really uh, pushed forward by first-time cruisers and new to brand. So, so the message is getting out. And that growth may continue into the future. Royal Caribbean CEO Jason Liberty says cruises are becoming more scalable and sustainable. So as the new ships are coming out, they're introducing new technologies. So they're getting more and more um, efficient. And they're also being prepared to take on alternative fuels as those fuels become available and scalable and affordable, not just for us, but also for society. So what's next for the travel industry in 2024? If this year showed us anything, it's expanding. We also spoke to the CEOs of Alaska Airlines and Hawaiian Airlines about what they expect to see in 2024 after the two companies inked a deal this year. We talked about the fact for so long that there was this pent up demand revenge travel that has seemed mm -hmm. to play out just a bit. What are you seeing ahead of the holiday season? And then when you're talking about those future plans for fleet, obviously a lot of that surrounded are driven by demand. How you see that shaping up as you look ahead to the next couple of years? Well, you know, demand is looking quite strong uh, for the peak travel seasons. Uh, so we're feeling pretty good about what we're seeing into Q4 uh, and uh, and into next year. Uh, that's still, uh, you know, to be determined. Uh, but we're hopeful that we have, uh, you know, the right capacity deployed for 2024 to match demand. And I think that's the that that's the key, uh, the key variable for us is, is deploying right capacity to match the right demand. Mm -hmm. And then you'll get the financial results that go with it. So we feel like we're in a good place. Uh, I can't speak for Peter. We're, we're still competitors before this uh, deal gets consummated. So I'll let him speak for that. Peter, go ahead. What do you see? Um, you know, we're feeling we're feeling good about the demand situation as well. Things have uh, have uh, recovered pretty well, so uh, I think it's going to be a strong peak season. We had a good Thanksgiving. Uh, we had good operations over Thanksgiving, which is uh, helpful. So uh, I'm really proud of all our team is doing to uh, compete in the marketplace. So will the industry continue its growth in 2024? Will it be saying bon voyage to its recent wins? I mean, look, that is a question. But when you think about the travel stocks and the travel sectors, they've performed very well this year. Uh, when you look at the cruises, Royal Caribbean's up more than 165 percent year to date. Carnival also up. It's up more than 130 percent year to date. You're looking at it. That's on a day basis. But if we're looking again at year to date, up more than 100 percent for the cruises. When you look at Delta Airlines, that's also up uh, year to date, up more than 20 percent year to date. Uh, and you look at United also up on the year. Uh, but you you want to one of the benchmarks that people talk about when we think about travel is uh, pre pandemic levels. Right. So demand is back at pre pandemic levels. But is the valuation there in terms of the share price? We know for cruises it's, it is. In fact, for well, for at least for Royal, it is. It's uh, back to pre-pandemic levels. For Carnival Caribbean, it's still playing some catch up. And look, that is the smaller player. Often we think in terms of what we know by name wise, people often think of Carnival, but Royals actually has a larger market cap. Uh, and the value proposition does seem to be there. And you have, look, we just had a recent note, Argus out last week, maintaining its buy rating on Royal Caribbean, boosting their price target to 100, above 140, or excuse me, to 142 bucks a share. So it has some room to run there. So the investment thesis is there. One of the challenges for the airlines, and it continues to be this, and it has been this in the past, is the margins. That is, you know, so it can perform well and the demand can be back. But when you think about the margins, is the value proposition there? It has showed up this year. Will it continue in 2024, Rochelle? I don't know. Turbulence, maybe. Well, We'll, we'll have to see how competitive they can keep that pricing, but we'll see. It's, it's a crowded market. And as we mentioned, back at pre-pandemic levels, we'll continue to track that for you. All right, we still have all your markets action ahead. Stay tuned. You're watching Yahoo Finance.
The 2024 presidential race is less than a year away, but before you know it, we'll see political ads popping up everywhere on our screens. Now, the election is expected to be a big revenue booster for the digital advertising space. According to Group M, one of the world's largest paid ad agencies, advertising dollars spent on the U.S. election will grow to roughly $16 billion next year. That's more than a 31 percent increase compared to the 2020 presidential election. So with projections of political ad spending expected to explode, how will those ad dollars get the most bang for their buck as audiences are now spread across streaming, TV and other digital platforms as well? Well, joining us to weigh in on this is John Neerman, Loop Media CEO. Thank you for being back on the show here. So what is the, what is the answer here, given how divisive we know this election is likely to be and how we tend to see ad dollars distributed? Where can advertisers put their money to work? It's going to be an interesting year, isn't it? You know, it's going to be uh, something to watch from top to bottom. So the dollars, as you said, are going to increase. There'll still be a lot going towards linear and cable, but an increasing amount will start to go digital, primarily in streaming, you know, which is where we are out of home. So when you're a captive audience, you're sitting at a bar, a restaurant, a hotel, something like that, it's one of the best places to get your message across. And that's where a lot of the, you'll start to see that investment ramp clearly as we go through the year. And John, what percentage of that political ad spend are we expecting to see go towards streaming? It's, we're going to be an estimate, same Group M estimate, kind of around 13 to 15% um, of that amount. So again, a significant increase. And I think that that's just the normal evolution. Uh, they're still used to spending in linear and cable, obviously, but they recognize that the more diverse audience and easier to reach, I think, in terms of different demographics is going to be on streaming. And John, of course, we have to talk about AI. As soon as we saw sort of these large language models start appearing, you know, deep fakes in commercials, advertising, things like that. How do you think that's going to affect how we see advertising going forward for the election? Well, I think AI, we work with a company called Assembly AI, by the way, and it, it's, it's a great safety barrier because you always want to make sure that the message is something that, especially in a public space, is going to be palatable and appropriate for an audience. So we do a screening just to make sure that, you know, there's nothing too odd with graphics or messaging or anything like that, really to kind of keep it safe and keep the integrity of the message. So you'll start to see it's just much as AI continues to uh, advance in everything that we do, really, it's going to help really target uh, for what we're talking about. Uh, John, one cautionary thing I think about when I think about AI with regard to politics. I think back to, I don't know if you remember the Cambridge Analytica uh, data scandal that happened with Facebook. So is what should we watch for and think about when AI comes into play with this election? Is AI friend or foe here? Well, it's the big debate, right? I think for the most part, it's it's quite friendly. Um, people of nefarious means for anything, they could go about and do what they want. So yeah, I remember that scandal well, and you just, you obviously don't know necessarily sometimes a route to where the messaging is coming from, but that is why we, especially at Loop, like to put in these protections to make sure it's verified, to make sure that these are in fact endorsed messages uh, and they are conveying something that the candidates want you to see. So. I think if people go through those protections and they go through that verification process, it shouldn't be a big issue. And so I think AI, for the most part, will continue to be a much positive impact. And John, a lot of attention goes to the, the presidential candidates themselves. But where else are you actually seeing the ad spending during the political season? Well, this is a really interesting thing, especially for a company like ours. We have something called local ads manager. So you don't have to, it's all kind of down ballot, right? So if, of course you've got the president, you've got Congress, et cetera. Uh, but think about your local city. If you're the mayor, if you're the city council, you can go in a bar and restaurant, you could go to a chain of stores and retail and put your ads on there. It's a terrific new way to reach an audience, a very affordable way to do it. You can do this literally for hundreds of dollars. So it's a great way for people to start. So you'll start to see that growth across whether it's local, county, state, regional, national. We'll continue to follow that story. Appreciate you joining us this morning. And I see your beach sign back there. Hopefully you're enjoying some good weather. It's a bit, bit chilly over here now, neck of the woods. <laughs> it's great where I am. Thank you. <laughs> Super jealous. John Neerman there, Loop Media CEO. Thank you so much. Take care. Thanks.
All right, well, let's get you a final check of the markets as we head into the noon hour. Still looking at green across the board here, although it has been hyper oscillating throughout the morning. But we see the Dow here just currently up about 56 points on the day. The S&P 500 currently up just barely, though, about six points. The Nasdaq leading the gains there, though, up about 23 points on the day so far. Well, that does it for now. I'm Rochelle Okufo alongside Diane King-Paul. Thanks for watching Yahoo Finance.